Good salary history, age 294. The first on the agenda is Matt Baran. Is he here? Yeah, Hi. right here. Uh, did you want to go first? No. So 275. You guys can decide. Yeah. And, and before we launch into this, I'd just like to remind us all that this is very similar but not equal to 275, our own bill on wage equity. Oh, and then, no, 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 it's fine. So we want to make sure we, like a which is what we had our press <laughs> conference on. So that's why you Yes, I have a couple of times, a couple yeah. of different things. Yeah. yeah. So. A minimum wage. Uh, no, I was in here for uh, permit reform. I forget the bill number. With Secretary Condos, that was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. 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 But we, we've seen you with Diane, who's so proud of you. Yeah, you should definitely see me kicking around. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Okay. Why don't you introduce yourselves? Yourself. Yep. <laughs> uh, my name is Matt Byrong. I am the owner of Three Squares Cafe in Virgins, and I'm a board member of Main Street Alliance. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's the connection. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so yeah, here to talk to you guys about the uh, equal pay bill from a business perspective. Um, I gave testimony on this up in house. General uh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago as well, and I guess I'll just kind of carry what I said to them as well. Um, from the business side of things, I mean, I, this this is a systemic problem that we're trying to figure out solutions to uh, by removing this one basic question, which can sort of be reframed in, in different ways. And I, I, I believe to still provide the employer with the ability to uh, you know, stay within what they establish as their reasonable pay range for a job. Uh, I, I don't think this bill is a very big ask on small businesses, or any business for that matter. I, I believe that businesses now have the ability, if this legislation was to go through, to sort of put in a, a range through their application process. So say you're, you're budgeted in your business to pay between forty and fifty thousand dollars for a job. You just say that up front. I think it actually would help in the screening process as well for HR departments. You know, you would see less people coming in with a seventy five thousand dollar salary history. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're leaving that age range blank. So I see it as actually a, a, an ability for businesses to cut out sort of a a swath of, of, of applicants that might be either overqualified or underqualified as well. I know that's not really where we're going with this, but it was sort of a, a side thought that I had to mm -hmm. it. Um, if I understand how it's written as well, you could also ask the applicant what their salary or pay range is for them to put it out on the table, uh, if I understand how it's written, correct? No. I believe so, yes. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that's kind of two different ways of doing it. Um, some of the um, conversations I've had with people who have had skepticism with this yeah. is it, it, it takes away a business's ability to negotiate with salary, but I think you go back to that age range converse, or age range, excuse me, wage range mm -hmm. conversation. So you're kind of building in your ability to negotiate with that. The business has the opportunity to establish what they are capable of paying within their payroll structure mm -hmm. by asking the question in that way. So I guess that's kind of my overview on that and how I've been looking at it. Any questions? No, I, I agree with you. I've actually thought of this in the reverse as well. Uh, so somebody that had been making $75,000, there's a number of reasons why they don't need to make $75,000 anymore. There's a change of status. They're moving. They don't want the same responsibilities, and they're willing to mm -hmm. downsize, have you will, to a position yeah. where $45,000 is fine. Yeah, I actually never looked at it that way, but that's a great point. Yeah. I just... Um, this may be a question for other witnesses, but um, 
the provision that allows after an offer of employment to ask for salary history at that point. I'm wondering if that could somehow be a loophole in the bill. Um, so you ask for it, and it says in here that the worker has to give authority to do so. I'm just wondering if at the point of hire? Yes, after you've made an offer. Yeah. It's not it's, it's so in section they, B. It, so if they say, I want to give that to you, they, is there any protection, and maybe for another witness, and I'll let counsel's not here, can then the employer withdraw the offer? Okay. Yeah, that almost does sound like it's kind of a backdoor to the same question, Bill. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm, I mean, just to that point, C bothers me a lot because it says nothing in this section shall be construed to prevent an employer from asking this question. So, you ask the question, and then you say, I prefer not to answer that. How does that impact an interview. So maybe we can chat about this with Carrie, but I think that is not yeah, good. No, I no, think that's, just, that's just that's just asking about yeah. the expectations. What do you that, want? Not past history. Not past history. Oh that's right, it's just expectations. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. On the other hand but I assume that this yeah, is on the other somehow, hand, that also colors it. I, so I mean, I have some Carrie history. could probably answer this. I assume this is all tied into the section of 495, which has enforcement provisions that may get at this concern, subsection B. But we may want to tighten it. Yeah, because there's stuff in 275 that I'd like to. Okay. Well, um, so you're speaking on behalf of Main Street Alliance or just on behalf of your own business? Uh, both? I'm here as a representative of both my business and Main Street Alliance, yes. Have you had conversations with other, like, similar, similar businesses, your peers, about this issue at all? Yeah, I mean, I have. Um, we, the, the restaurant industry really kind of does this already. I, most of your hires are pretty much minimum wage to about 15, 16, 17 bucks an hour. So when the applicants come in, you're pretty much firing out a, a range that you're willing to hire at. I mean, especially with unemployment as low as it is right now, in my industry especially, um, nobody's really in a position to start lowballing skilled labor. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So, if anything, I would say, and I know this is just uh, specific to the to the labor situation right now, but the employees are definitely in the uh, strongest bargaining position in a while. Yes, especially in the market. Is to, is making the pay level. Okay, well thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. You weren't biting Harry. on that one, Becker? You weren't listening to me, were Harry. No, I was reading the bill. I read the bill, I'm reading 275. It said it's interesting that the market demand is what setting the pay level. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're not biting on that. <laughs> no, I wasn't you weren't biting you just weren't listening to me. <laughs> was, That's of course. <laughs> I can't learn. We change the state house. Yes. Emily Long is also in our color. We're good. We're, we're okay. trying to get spring to hurry on up. We right? got it. Yeah. Palm Sunday comes. Man, I'm in this jacket. <laughs> All right. My name is Carrie Brown. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Commission on Women. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify about this. We've done a fair amount of research on this topic at the commission. We've got um, some information on our website that you can read more detailed research that we've done. Uh, before I start what I was going to say, may I address the question that just came up? One of the questions that just came up about the uh, after an offer has been made. Yes. And it's, it's specifically an offer with compensation. So you have to say, um, I'm offering you this job at you know $50,000. And then the prospective employee has to give permission for you to confirm their past or current salary, which I agree could be a difficult thing to say no to. But I think that you're far enough along into the negotiation process at that point when an offer has actually been made with compensation that I'm not really worried about that being a backdoor to continuing some kind of discrimination or unethical practice. Really? Well, yeah. What, what's to prevent somebody from saying you no? Know? 
we 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 uh, we you know we've had second thoughts or and, and, and my my business mm -hmm. my controller has come back to me and said you know we really can't afford this at the moment. Sure, but that can happen at any point with any employer. And can you sue if you've been made an offer and they renege? I. I mean, is there? Of that, but I don't it's a contractual. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You haven't entered into a contractual yeah. relationship. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It, the, the, the problem world, is in the real world, you could very yeah. easily get out of it. That's why it might be important to understand what the retaliation or you know uh, the enforcement mechanism is, and to to pretextually try and get around the intent of the law by offering, then finding out the salary, then renegotiating. Yeah. It, may be a, it may be helpful to have it tie into a provision where it, the employer can't do that and get out of mm -hmm. the contract. Um, I, I easily think that's a, a broader employment question. We'll that ask. You have. We'll, 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 yeah. we'll ask Dave. So, but, but there, if an employer has made an offer to somebody, why does it have any need or business to confirm a, a, a past salary history? Who cares? Why is that important? I, I'm not an employer, so you have to ask me. You are an employer. That. You employ a person. I, I supervise people. Yeah. You <laughs> hire them. I do hire it's them. It's a good question. Do you remember the history of this bill in the House? Is this something that was in the bill initially? Or that was in the sense? bill initially, yeah, yeah so and that's language that's it's not taken in. from other states. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't in our bill in 275. Right. I think so. that the thinking is to give as much flexibility um, to employers as possible while still maintaining these constraints. But it, I don't know why it's necessary. I'd really love to let's look at B. I don't. Allison, no matter what we put in there, okay, if I offer somebody a job, right? A, I'm offering them a job because I think that they can do the job that I need them to do. They're the most qualified person, you know, for a variety of reasons. Right. That's the person I'm hiring. Now all of a sudden I find out that you are making thirty-two thousand dollars instead of fifty. I don't really care. So then why are you asking? Well, they don't necessarily ask. This right. just gives them the ability to ask. Right. I guess what I would ask to what end is B. I don't understand. And, and if I don't want to hire someone after that, even after I've made it an offer, I'm not going to hire them and I'm going to find a reason not to. Well, you I know, it turns out we didn't have them. I think office. there are more important things to be adding to this bill than that. I mean, this just, it, this sort of bothers me. So I'm just putting it out there that this sort of bothers me. Um, okay, let's <coughs> start with Carrie's. Okay, yeah, sorry. Right. Oh, no problem. Did we not start? I thought we did. We did. <laughs> we did. So I want to give you just sort of um, a bit of the rationale for this, and that um, this is a, a admittedly imperfect tool that we have to combat the wage gap, but it there's some some solid, uh, really solid reasoning to assume that it's it may have an impact. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the wage gap. Uh, in Vermont, women are making 84% of what men are making. When we um, break it down by race, we see an even different picture. And so this is something that um, I can tell you about different races of women, but it's also true for men. Yeah. You know, it's men of color are making less money. Um, but for just for example, in Vermont, um, the wage gap is 51% uh, for black women. They're making 49% of what men are making. And um, so anyway. Can I? Yeah. But so just to tease that apart a little mm -hmm. bit, but then you're comparing it to all men or men of color? So men, you see what I'm saying? That one I believe is a comparison to white men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And so if we, I don't have data for so black all men, men compared to all <coughs> men, but it's yeah. certainly worse than it oh, is. Absolutely. Or white women who are eighty four percent. No, white women are more like ninety three percent. All it's women, the, all are eighty four. All women are eighty four. Biggest disparity yeah. is interesting. So yeah. it's even worse by color. Yes. Yeah. I'm surprised uh, with uh, the lack of diversity that we have in Vermont that it drags it down that much. 
Well, you've got, I mean, Rutland may not be that diverse, but Brattleboro certainly has grown a lot more diverse in the last 15, 20 years, as has Burlington. So, and that's, those are population centers. No, so I'm looking at my bubble of Killington and... Yeah, you are. I, I'll, I'll, look at the bubble of who can afford $125 a day to yeah. say. Yeah. Go ahead, Carrie, yeah. I apologize for so I, because I know about um, the economic <laughs> impact on women, that's what I'm going to talk more specifically about. Um, so for instance, the, that wage gap is something that starts right out of college. So in 2013, the AEW, American Association of University Women, did a study looking at college graduates' first jobs. And they found that um, controlling for personal demographics, occupation, college major, hours worked, location, there was still, men were still getting paid 6% 6 more. So there's still, there's always this 6%? little bit. 6%? 6 6.6, yeah. And then that just, that's so they're starting off at a deficit, and then that just widens as they, as they go. And so when you're starting off being paid less, and then your future salary is based on where you were before, then it just right. kind of cements that disparity on an ongoing basis. Um, and so there was a, a Study done by Hired, which is a clearinghouse for tech and startups. And they, H I R E. And H I R E D. It's the name of a company. In 2016, they analyzed 100,000 job offers, and they found that men got higher salary offers than women for the same job title at the same company 69% of the time. Say that one again. So, men and women were offered jobs at the same job title, same company. 60, 69% of the time men were offered a higher salary than Jeez. women. Uh, so, <clears throat> so we know this is happening. This is not just about, you know, certainly it was much a greater problem with overt discrimination mm -hmm. against women in the workplace in the past, but we still see that for whatever reasons this disparity Thank continues. In um, 2004, there was a lawsuit against Boeing. It's a class action lawsuit on behalf of the female employees there. And they settled it for $72.5 million uh, because they had instituted a system where they were hiring, pe they were hiring people at standard 20% more than they had been making in their previous jobs. So they just kind of put in this formula, which I think they probably thought, well, this is great. You know, people get a 20% raise when they come and work for us. But it just cemented those disparities. And they were able to document that it did. You know, they looked at the men and the women. They could see this is different. And then when they, they gave them 10% raises after that, and so it just kept getting wider and wider, and there was kind of no way to break out of it. So that was a really clear situation where they could see how it happened. Um, and, and then there's also a, a, a dis difference between men and women when they are asked this question and they either answer or they don't answer. So right. when, generally speaking, when this is from a 2016 study, <laughs> this is all pretty recent stuff, yeah. um, men who refused to disclose their salary histories ended up getting higher salary offers. <laughs> and women who refused got lower yeah. salary offers. Yeah. So there's kind of a, and this, this is also, we see a similar thing in negotiation, mm -hmm. where everybody who negotiates aggressively kind of risks being seen as unlikable or difficult to work with, but it's not a penalty for men. It, it's, it's fine, it doesn't, but, it, but for women it, it can be a penalty and can result in lower, lower money. All right. Um, you have any good news, Carrie? <laughs> 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 it's Are we right. less horrible than we used to be? Yeah. <laughs> we're less well, horrible. Yeah, we're a little yeah. less horrible. I, the good news is we have this film. We could do yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. That's the good news. I, you know, I hear today. What a theory. The, this, the sort of good and bad news is that in the old days when you'd open up the newspaper and see the jobs for women and the jobs right. for men, you know, we don't see that anymore. But uh, And that's good, but the, the bad news is that it's can be kind of more subtle. You know, like at, at Boeing, when they were offering people 20% more than their past salaries, they, they were not thinking, I'm sure, that this was a great way to continue paying women less. Right. You know, it was just right. a system that they right. were And they thought that was along. attracting people. Yeah, well, yeah. it was. And it was. I'm sure it was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Differential so. salary. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but so it is an insidious 
Right, exactly. Situation. And and this is why uh, a move like this is a kind of a you know way to sort of come in from the side at it right. and d disrupt some of the patterns that we see in the hopes that maybe it could change. Do you think the this results. can help move the needle a little bit? Well, I think it probably can. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, we don't have any empirical data on what's happened in other states because this is all really new. Yeah. But then we would look at kind of the well, a couple things that might make us think it might work are um, there's this thing called the anchoring effect that I didn't know about until we did this research and I learned about this where kind of the first number that's thrown out there can serve yeah. as an anchor and if it's high, then it helps pull the whole negotiation up higher. If it's low, it kind of pulls it all low. And this has been demonstrated in studies of various kinds and um, in including specifically with salaries as well as other kinds of things. But so that if you were to go in and, and state that, you know, if you know the job pays $60,000, but you go in and you say, I want 100 to 120,000. And even if it's ridiculously high, often that can kind of, it sets the conversation up a bit higher. Whereas if you go in and you know it pays 60,000 and you say, well, you know, 50 to 60 would be good, then it pulls it all down. And so that's one reason to think that uh, not forcing people to go in with that lower number, if for them it is a lower number, might influence that process. So how many, you mentioned something that this is taken from other states. How many states have laws like this? Well, let's see. There's Massachusetts. Um, all right, let me see. So Massachusetts, um, Albany County, New Orleans, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, New York City, California, Delaware, Oregon, Puerto Rico, and then there's a whole bunch of more states that have it introduced that are kind of in the same place that we are that are working on it. So this whole, whole issue of pay equity, I mean, I'm sure you've done all the research and stuff. So this is one tool to try and get it. Are there many others? I mean, is there any, is there any state that has any bills that have been put in that said, you know, you shall pay men and women the same amount of money? Well, um, so Vermont has done a lot of, of good stuff with legislation. Um, we have a very strong equal pay law, and um, there, there may be a few other things that we can do, but when you look at kind of a list of recommended legislation, AEW has this whole check, checklist. We're really We're pretty right out there. there. We're doing pretty well. Yeah. There, there's one other area that we had in 275 that would improve it even better, even more, which is the uh, extension of um, uh, wage discrimination to include all protected classes, which mm -hmm. they didn't address here, which I'd love to have us think about at mm -hmm. least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which would be another wage protection. Mm -hmm. um, there are. Um, in our research with the Change the Story initiative that we've been doing for the past few years, we have collected, as you know, a lot of data around women's economic status, and a lot of that data was really, really hard to get. Um, not because it didn't exist, but because it was just not readily available. And so I've been having a lot of really good conversations with the Department of Labor about getting more of that, and they've actually kind of stepped up their um, data collection and reporting so it's easier, if like you can go into their website now and there's this lovely manipulable spreadsheet that you can see by industry area around Vermont, how much women are making, how much men are making. It's really, it's really helpful. Um, what we can't see is by occupation and that would be, uh, again, had lots of these conversations with them, an enormous ask for them. And, um, you know, if, if you, the legislature, wanted to fund that, that would be great, but it would also be a really a tremendous amount of money. Um, so kind of more important are looking, I think, are looking at um, ways to uh, make that data more accessible. And I don't know that you need legislation to do that, but I think that your, your committee questions to the Department of Labor about how, you know, what is occupation? Yeah, and what does it look like for men and women? Um, looking at 
workforce education and training programs, and this is also something that we've been talking about. Oh, this is a big Canada. issue we're going to be yeah. looking at in the yeah. workforce. Bill. To try to find out who is uh, being trained for which jobs, how much money are they projected to make, are women tend to be trained for lower paid jobs, men for higher paid jobs. If we just don't really know that, and it would be that, helpful to get that data. That's, so That's part of the pay equity issue, but mm -hmm. this particular bill is sort of designed to get at yeah. for the same job somebody getting paid. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I mean overall as well, because we're really concerned with the overall earnings of women in Vermont, um, as well as discrimination within a particular job. But then, also, so this is where the, the gender pay gap is a big amorphous thorny problem in some ways, because in some cases we have really clear discrimination of two people hired for the same job with the same experience and the men getting paid more. Those are not very common. So it's more often that we see things like this bill is trying to address, where there's kind of a systemic perpetuation of a disparity. And so, you know, that's why we have to kind of nibble at it from all sides. I think the key to this bill is, is going to be the enforcement piece, because I think there are in practicality, when you're an employer employee, they'll find ways to work around this. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be clear that if you don't want this disclosed, the past history disclosed, that the employer shouldn't be going anywhere near this, formally or informally. Mm -hmm. So it's important that there be, you know, ultimately a case somewhere down the line that sort of gets publicized or someone tried to do an end run. And it's, affordable to the employee saying you can't do that mm -hmm. and there's got to be more than just a, a slap on the wrist otherwise this won't I don't think this will work mm -hmm. as well as it's intended to work yeah. Yeah. Okay. Question. Um, one of the things I'd love to ask you uh, is what the effect on the poverty rate would be if women we're paid the same. Why amount. it would be fifty-seven percent? Yeah, and what additional economic impact would it have? On what, our I have three billion dollars? No, a billion, a billion dollars. A billion, okay. About a billion. A billion dollars. It's yeah. about a billion dollar economic impact if economy. women, if we slowly bring women up to being, it, it's that. It's you. I'm for the issue. I, I don't need to debate that. But, no, no, I'm but just it, saying but it there comes are, from one pocket and goes to another. So, but absolutely, and that's fine. I'd love well, to have I it just like I, yeah. I, I don't wants, disagree. With I think that you know, qualified women should be paid as the same as qualified men. Yeah, no doubt about that. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, I just wanted to say that the the question, um, Senator Strachan, that you're bringing up around enforcement, um, you've got someone here from the Attorney General's office who will be able to speak to that. Much I think tonight. she's ready to enforce. <laughs> because we have enforcement provisions in the rest of the title, right? I believe that are there for us to lean on. Me. Lean on. Thank uh, you. Just a question about four <clears throat> B. Um, not with it, notwithstanding A4 of the section, after an employee, an employer has made an offer of employment with compensation, it may confirm if he or she provides written authorization for the employer to do so. Um, I'm just thinking about ways somebody might work the law. Right. Would it be possible to, to just put out a lowball offer? With, you know, for the job that pays sixty, we'd like to hire you and pay you uh, forty thousand. What did you make at your last job? Mm -hmm. Is that legal? Um, it would be. It would be. As my understanding under this, mm -hmm. but, uh, except the employee would not be required to answer that. Right. From the perspective. Of the so but I had real problems with that before you came. I, yeah. We I, we flagged that. It, I had real problems with this. I do too. But the um, the employee isn't going to accept that offer. Well, maybe they might. Maybe no. I mean, one of the things we're talking about is this acculturated acceptance right. of the of the inequality, yeah. and you know, so it just seems like we don't really need that. I don't think. It's it's like, it wasn't a two seventy five bill. There we go. It's like the first responders. <laughs> Well, it's, it's just, it's really, I mean, just 
for women who aren't necessarily aware of this, I mean, this is a classic way that women have unknowingly perpetuated pay inequity for ever. Right. Well, I, I come at this from the academic world where it, the hiring, the thing that's most problematic is uh, employers seeking to know the marital status, oh. and usually because they want to prevent a spousal hiring situation where they offer the job and then the person says, I need to give a job to my spouse. And so, yeah, um, so many of them, advice has been going out for years and years to people not to answer those questions, but they keep getting asked, even, you know, in supposedly uh, aware uh, mm -hmm. job candidates. Yeah. So, this, this strikes me as problematic. Jane wants to go over so. um, many, many questions get asked in your reviews, like, do you have children? Are you planning to have children? Things like that. That are not necessarily illegal to ask, but they're, the answers are, are not a legal, legal grounds for making your hiring decision. So as an employer, it doesn't seem like a good idea to ask. You're sort of opening yourself up to. Um, being accused of discrimination in your hiring practice, but it still happens all the time. So how are we better educating our young women about questions that are fair and not fair in job interviews? Who's training? I mean, I know increasingly college uh, campuses have terrific career counseling centers, but you know, it would be great for the Commission on Women to work, to reach, and you may already be doing giving it. us work to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm giving them more work to do. To, to reach out with the Women's Fund, <laughs> to reach out to all the college career counseling uh, centers and say, are you training women? Not, you know, what mm -hmm. questions are okay, what aren't? Yeah. Uh, how can they be, you know, advocates for the best paying job possible? And blah, blah, blah. We do have coming up this spring three free salary negotiation workshops, one in Newport, one in St. Albans, and one in Rutland. Right. And so I'll make sure you know about those and you can spread the word. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's great. Good. Because I think it's only, this is only as good as our educating young people about it. I think you should go to the ones in Newport and St. Albans, and I'll go to the one in Rutland. <laughs> well, I don't know if my car will let me go to St. Um, Albans. I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Karen. Oh, oh, wait, can I just ask Karen one more question? Mm -hmm. So in 275, you know, we have this uh, provision uh, which amends the Fair Employment Practices Act to expand the wage discrimination provisions to extend all mm -hmm. protected classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, how, can you give us a notion of how concerning that is. I mean, I think it just trues up our statutes and would be a good amendment to make at this point, and it um, fits with this bill. Yeah, I so I I will definitely defer the legal opinion to Emily. Um, I I don't have uh, I don't see uh, problems with it, but I certainly have spoken to people who spoken to women who feel uh, wary of kind of watering down the intent of this, which was to. Um, eliminate the gender disparity that we that we have so well documented. Um, so I think you might hear that from from some other people. I don't I don't think that it would actually have that effect on uh, myself. Yeah. So I, I yeah. Well, we have the That's attorney general here. I, like, I want to yeah. explore that line of question with her. So. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley. Yes. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay in arriving as there's traffic all the way backed up from Burlington to Milton, which is very fun. Um, but anyway, so I'll keep this uh, short and sweet. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts on H-294, uh, specifically as passed by the House. Um, in general, the Chamber supports equal pay for equal work. Um, we certainly support the intent of the bill um, to disregard an applicant's salary um, prior pay history when negotiating their pay for a new position, um, based on many of the reasons that we just heard. Um, we often ask uh, member employment attorneys to look at bills like this just to make sure there's not going to be any um, legal ramifications. We haven't heard back quite yet, so if we do hear um, something back from that, we'll certainly follow up with you um, just to check on those things. 
Um, the one concern we did see with the bill um, as passed by the House is the very first section, um, which says an employer shall not screen a uh, prospective employee based on his or her wages, benefits, compensation, or salary history. And our concern with this section is that if an applicant voluntarily discloses this information, um, then the employer would likely screen the employee based on that. Um, and the example that we can think of is if a job applicant voluntarily discloses their current salary to a prospective employer, the employer would reasonably screen out an applicant if that salary was significantly higher than what they were currently offering uh, or than what they were offering with the position. Um, so we would suggest removing this section um, just to true up that in the case where an applicant voluntarily discloses this, this, this information and um, that their current wage put them out well outside of the range of the current job. But what if they offer an explanation, like the one David Susi suggested, which is, you know, somebody who's coming back into the workforce after having had been a CEO somewhere and, and happy to work as a, a kindergarten teacher. We see a couple examples of that. I've seen that in my neck of the woods, where people who come out of retirement to actually do something they've always wanted to do. And I would think at that point they would that would not be a problem, and they would explain why they were. I think with that explanation, the employer would certainly take that into account and because of that reason, not screen them out of the process, but if someone wants to, if they're applying for a job that pays maybe sixty to 80000 and they disclose that they previously were making 100000 But then they probably year. wouldn't have be looking at that job unless they were giving a good reason for disclosing that. Potentially, which is a good argument, but I think just, I think we think that just taking out this section would remove any confusion um, from em employers based on that. Is, what, what do you interpret screen to mean, to screen out, to dis discontinued consideration? Um, yeah, or, so... Or make a decision based upon that? I think that's how we interpret it, yes, to um, to pretty much to use that information to make a decision on the employee. So what if I come to you and I say, well, I really, I want this job over cheap. I can't tell you that? Um, I think you certainly could, um, and I, th I think that would, it's would not... Would you not be able to use that information? I got a bargain basement person here who wants to do this, and I'll save some money and he's qualified and case closed, all other applicants are out. I think that wouldn't be, would that necessarily be a problem without the language? Well, that, that yeah, language I'm trying is to understand. Understand. I don't think that language is... That, that's the definitive statement in the bill. Mm -hmm. As far as I can see, the others are elaborations on it. Um, you read screen to mean just basically make a decision based upon that? Or? Yeah, so in other words, um, disqualify from consideration. Yeah. Um, but could it mean? Or, or well, even. How about the reverse? I, well, no, I, I don't read it that way. I, I read it as adding into the <coughs> process, adding into the calculation for hiring and for the offer. That's the way I'm seeing screen. And screen isn't the most useful verb in that. Yeah. Context. How about if we took care of it in uh, four? So seek the salary history from a prospective employee, and then you can do the grammar or a comma, or, or from his or her current or former. See, I would put employer. that first. I agree with you. I think I would start with that one. That's the that's the nuts and bolts of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's. And I think we'd agree with that. That that's the the the, 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 the that main reason of this bill appears to be to prevent employers from asking an applicant their wages, and I think. Well, there's also in that first one, benefits, compensation. Yeah. We could add that to... I think we'd just add the from number four. Yeah. If we could put four it. as one and added all the other stuff, to mm -hmm. me, that th they're redundant slightly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but they no, just right. strike me as yeah, redundant. No. And seek is better than screen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. there aren't that many jobs. So there are certain jobs, like in state government, where you're working... Uh, in a fairly transparent fashion where your salaries are fairly transparent because you're working at X level and so they have a notion of where you're, mm -hmm. what's... What would be the correct grammar on that? Uh, well, I think it's Professor good. Baruth? Oh, it's of a perspective employer. For their, and I would add the other things. The salary history benefits... Yeah. But we have to make sure, because right now I read that, that it doesn't include the prospective employee. 
Right. Right. So we want to add a phrase about that. Yeah. From a pr prospective employee. From his. From a instead from, of of from. Yeah. From his. Or from her. a prospective employee. Oh. Or from his or her current or former employer. We don't have to draft right here. We'll have to right. transfer. Well, Damien will do that. He's on this bill. Because he's on the. Uh, he's on 275. No, so that, that I not having sought it if it's offered. Yeah. Then. I think that was the main concern we had. That I seemed to kind of miss the mark of what the intent of the bill is, which we certainly agree with, which is that a, an employer should not be asking an applicant for their salary history. Now, if the applicant disclosed that information, it's hard for an employer to act like they didn't hear that and not screen the prospective employee on the information they were just given. So it might hit the mark if, um, like you were just saying, to have it that they simply cannot ask for said yeah, information. Yeah, I, I just think it's redundant. I, I've been bothered by number one. Can I add, th throw in a wrinkle? So my salary is available on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, anybody at UVM or many public institutions are available. Right. That's, yeah. So this would prevent an employer from going on the internet, googling right. the person, and finding there. Do we? Want to speak to that? No. no. You I could say that, seek I, or screen. I think that gets. Of course. You could I do think both. That gets I mean, too broad. Because mine is too. So now we're telling people that they can't go to public <laughs> records <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> on the internet. Well, we or go to the town report of Killington to see how much well, Dave's could say That first one, as it stands, would. Yes, it would. It would that, cover that. Right, situation. which is what I was trying to say with state employees, where it's the same thing. I never went on a website looking at yeah. who's salary. Did you go on the website to look and see what legislators are paid before you said yes? No, because I'm not in it for the money. Why not? Why not? Yeah, well, people yeah. like retire <laughs> now. <laughs> I like okay. seeker screen. Okay, we'll we'll work on it with our legislators. And we can get rid of one. Uh. We want it. Want it take care of the situation that you raised about voluntary. Mm -hmm. and we want to make sure we don't inadvertently allow people from looking up things that are public knowledge. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Emily, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Emily Adams, Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Unit. It's my first time here in front of you. Um, I'm new to the office as of January, but I worked with Julio Thompson, who I believe you've seen many times. <laughs> um, and just a little bit about me. Um, while I'm new to the office, I've spent the past four and a half years practicing labor and employment law in Burlington. So I do have a background in this area. Oh, the chair is going to love you. <laughs> Which firm? <laughs> you see, he style. might not love me so much anymore. Paul Frank and Collins. Okay. So. Um, Paul Frank. That's Collins. Right, exactly. Labor plus employment. Yes. So, um, anyways, <laughs> little little legal humor here. Yes. Yeah. No. No. Right. And a good graphic image for what that meant, and what it means. That it's right. a great title. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so our office is obviously um, gener very supportive of remedying the underlying issue that this bill is intending to fix in terms of the wage gap. Um, I do have some specifics I want to talk about about this law and other jurisdictions, but I want to go first back to that question you were just looking at with screen, and I just want to put something in front of you to consider um, and take it as you will that there are other laws that we enforce um, regarding hiring where someone may choose to disclose something such as a disability, where that's still an impermissible um, characteristic to make a determination on. So, in how you choose to move forward with this, I think you need to just think about what the intent is because if someone discloses, you could still choose to have it be unlawful to base your decision on that and it would just be a matter of the parties being put to the proof on that. Well then, that would argue for including the all further protecting all protected classes in this bill because what you just referenced actually goes beyond the scope of just men and women. <laughs> well, I was just looking at an analogous situation. I can talk about protective classes, and I will talk about protective so, classes at the end if we'd like so to So, I mean, that's an interesting comment. So, in the example that I was giving, where somebody really wants the job and is willing to work for less and wants to disclose that information 
to the employer of the past history or whatever. They, maybe they made less, maybe they just want to work for less. You're basically saying this law should prevent that employee and employer reaching an arrangement based upon? I'm not saying it should. I'm saying, but you, you say know. But you say we, we, we so undermine the goal of this bill by allowing those two parties to reach an agreement? Potentially. I mean, I read the word screen as to make a determination as to applicants. And so if you're That's making a determination out. based on their salary history, but your situation where you're saying, I'll work for cheap, I don't know that that's wages, benefits, compensation, or salary history. That's what you're, that's really more in the lines of what you're offering to work for, which is, which is actually authorized by this bill, which is, um, you know, I, I believe it's, let's see. Expectations. Expectations. Yeah. And, and, and you can always voluntarily disclose whatever information you want in an interview. It's just what we're seeking to ensure is that it's not, uh, that you aren't divulging stuff that puts you at an unfair advantage. And so are you, say, are you saying that the first thing is referencing past wages, not, not future? Not That's future. my understanding of the intent based on his wages, benefits, compensation, or salary history. Um, this bill specifically says you can ask about expectations, so I take that to mean past or current if they're in a, in a position at that time. It has to be. Um, it has to be past or current because otherwise it wouldn't be right. his or her wages. Right. It's yeah. past right. tense. Yeah. Right. Or current. And just to speak to the chair's uh, question, the fact that somebody voluntarily encourages an employer to an impermissible act or discussion doesn't negate the law right. or, or the larger principle. Right. Um, so I think what the chair is saying is could somebody, to make themselves seem more attractive, uh, sort of illegally encourage a discussion that, that would cut against their rights? And, and I think they could in the same way that you know, any of the other situations we talked about, you could disclose your marital status and say, I don't plan to have any kids, please hire me. But that wouldn't change the idea that that's an impermissible conversation according to the law. Or an impermissible factor to base your decision right, off of. Right, that's um, right. Not necessarily an impermissible conversation. Well, to be for the employer to initiate, right? So, um, do you plan to have kids? Is. is, is uh, Right. I mean, I don't think that per se would be a violation of any law, but then acting upon that yeah. statement would certainly would be. So yeah. um, I would agree with that. And I just wanted to point that out because, again, it's a decision of where yeah. you want to go with the law, but I do think that that word screen does have a, a purpose um, in the way it's written. We want I think it's a lot easier to prevent uh, employers from asking these questions and having them on, on applications than it will be to say, well, why didn't you hire, uh, you know, Phil Baruch? Because that becomes subjective. These are at least. Uh, yeah. But you are trying to change the culture, right? So, right. So uh, I suppose I'm arguing myself back around to supporting screen <laughs> as well as seek. Um, so that's one and four. If we put them together, I, I want to retain both those ideas. Yeah. But they can't seek it and they can't screen for it as their decision making process. Correct. We want this to be as fulsome as possible. Fulsome, exactly. Fulsome. And I stand by it. So let's just, just to uh, finish this part of the conversation, going back to Senator Bruce's example about that his salary is public, is public knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody. Both his salaries. If, if somebody under this first sentence, if without asking, you just know right. what the person's making. And you have, you know, maybe judged by that, that he's more, he or she is more likely to take the job because this is a big pay raise from what they were getting on. Would that be, in, in having that knowledge, would that be in violation of subsection one? I don't think it would be. I think it would be making the decision based on that. It's the same, again, to use an analogy, it's the same as Facebook being out there, and you may look at your list of applicants, and you know. But I thought I thought 
Well, I thought we were saying that screening means making a decision. So, so you have that knowledge from the public from the public record, and you have that knowledge that they be they may be more apt to take the job, and you're saying so. Therefore, you would offer it to them as opposed to someone else because it's a big pay jump for them. No, because they're more likely to view a lowball offer on your part as being an increase for them. Yeah. I think you mostly use it. I don't. I don't worry as much that it would determine the hire as that it would the the offer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So right. you know, somebody's making fifty, and you were going to offer seventy-five, but having seen that on the internet, you then right. offer them sixty. Right. Um, because you can. You can, and you'll look better to your boss that you've got the person for less. Right. And if this is an equal pay bill designed at least in part to improve the pay of women, then if that woman's salary is public knowledge, somehow you got to figure out how to make it not public knowledge or, or factor in, in the decision making, even though they know the information. I mean, I think it's the same as any other public knowledge you can find out there about an applicant. At the end of the day, you know, you're you're not to use it to make your decision, even if you have that knowledge, and that's a tough area to suss out if you're being held to your proof right. on this in a case. Right. Yep. What what the deciding factors were, um, but you know, I, I see it the same as anything else you could find on the internet about a person that may relate to a protected class or um, any other impermissible okay. ca category for hiring. Right, someone's religion. Sure. Right. You know they're a member of a church um, just because they're on Facebook mm -hmm. um, related to that church. Well, that there was they went to a yeah, school. Well, I was going to say there was a, discussion. a case not at our university but at, at one in Boston that I know about where they were hiring. Went online, found out that somebody was a fundamentalist Christian. Mm -hmm. They didn't want that you know person at their department, and so they um, right. but there were emails disclosed where they had discussed the person's religion. And so that was all found out on the internet because the person was politically active. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the internet complicates everything. But it does. I, I can't believe it. I'm coming back around to Allison's point on, uh, on, <laughs> on B in that uh, one is how often would somebody uh, make an offer, okay, I want to pay you $60,000 a year, right, and then go to her former employee and say, how much did she make? I, I don't see them doing that. Oh, you know, right. An offer is an offer, and, you know, this is this position, I have $60,000, that's what it's worth, this job, and that's what I've budgeted for. Now you go back to the employer or her former employer and what was she making? And then go, oh, wait a minute. You know what? On second thought, I can only pay you 45. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Alice's point was to get rid of that? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Eject your seat. Bye, bye, Mr. B. So, I, Mr. I, I do want to speak to one thing that may affect that. It may not. But, it, and I, to be honest, I don't know exactly why this provision was put in, but I, I have a suspicion based on another issue. So uh, Carrie spoke to the other states and uh, cities that have... Um, she said some have had this section. Right, exactly. And so there is, um, though, one, the city of Philadelphia is facing a lawsuit based on um, their law that was similar to this from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, that lawsuit is, is based, it's a constitutional challenge based on this being an impermissible restriction of speech under the First Amendment. Um, it's, oh, it's still pending. Um, it's been pending for about a year. Um, we spoke about this, Julia spoke about this to House General, um, but because there's not a lot of empirical data out there, um, because this is such a new, a new trend, a new idea in the law, to support this type of law, the Chamber's argument is that there's not enough justification um, to... Uh, or centuries of justification. You are kidding. So it's that, out there. It's a 37-page um, so, amended complaint. I have so to you're, you're saying that this mitigates 
the constitutional potential constitutional issue because it allows but speech. Potentially. After. So there's one aspect. The second aspect of that case is also that there was a vagueness issue with regards to they had it in their law, in the Philadelphia law, a provision as to an employer could use salary info that was gained knowingly and willingly. And the chamber said, well, how do we know what knowingly and willingly is? That's too vague. And so it may be that the jurisdiction that legislative council took this from, and again, I don't know, this is probably maybe a Damien question, um, was trying to be more concrete in when an employer could choose to use that issue based on some of that pending, um, in that particular pending case. I'm not aware of any other um, pending litigation regarding this issue, and there are other states and cities that have recently, most of these laws were passed in 2016 and 17, and so um, the dates that they were enacted, you know, came into effect, the effective date was all in the past couple months, but I'm not aware of any other litigation, but the Philadelphia case is... So the Philadelphia, that. basically it was B that we're talking about, and, but in that language had knowingly and willingly? No, the primary issue in Philadelphia was the First Amendment issue, where they were restricting an employer's speech with their argument by saying, you can't ask this question. A secondary issue was that that knowingly and willingly language was vague. And so, again, I don't, I don't know that this is, uh, was intended to be a solution to that, but it's possible that this was intended to be more concrete than something like knowingly and willingly. I'd be willing to take that lawsuit on. <laughs> I think that is the most absurd lawsuit ever, restricting free speech free speech on this issue? So it's still pending. Last I, um, last I knew, the parties were asking for it, or rather the city was asking for an evidentiary hearing to put on evidence as to why this law actually really? did have support. Well, um, the chamber must be desperate. Uh, but, sorry, Ashton. On that section, well, I'm you know, inclined also to get through I'm wondering if it potentially was put in sort of in response to the uh, ability of an employer to ask about uh, the employee's salary expectations or requirements. So I'm sitting across the table from the perspective of the employee and said, so what do you expect to make? And the person volunteered, well, I was making $75,000 at this company, you know, that's my lifestyle, I need to make that amount of money. Okay. So they make the job offer and then the employer says, I want to double check if that was accurate yeah. and finds out it wasn't accurate. Is that perhaps why that section is in there? It may be. I don't. I don't actually know why it's in there. Um, I, Damien used the example of when I think when he was here doing the walkthrough of um, something similar to that. Someone saying, "I really need seventy-five thousand dollars," and the employer being able to go and confirm that. Um, but I, you know, I can't answer as to why it was put in here. Um, you did ask a question earlier about uh, retaliation provisions, mm -hmm. and because this is part of Section 495, you're correct that the fair employment or uh, unlawful right. employment practice is 495, and then it would the retaliation provisions from that would be incorporated. And what are the refresh my memory? Are there yeah damages and attorney's fees? What, what's involved in that? So, so the retaliation provisions would include. Bear with me for a second. Um, an employer would not um, be able to discharge or take any other discrimination against an employee because they oppose any act that's prohibited under the chapter. They've lodged a complaint um, or they've known that they're about to lodge a complaint. Um, and, and so it would, it would protect anyone, I think, from, from here, in this case, from saying, no, I'm not going to offer you my salary history. And then, them, you know, just I'm not hiring them because of that reason. In terms of uh, damages, I'm just trying to see if the damages would be in 495. I believe that. The enforcement, your question was. It's, right, enforcement. It's enforcement, attorney's fees may come in under each individual section. Let's see, penalties and enforcement. So it would be the AG's office, they can seek civil penalties, um, attain assurance of discontinuance, conduct civil investigations, 
any person aggrieved can bring an action in superior court, uh, compensatory and punitive damages, um, equitable relief, including attorney's fees and costs. Um, that's so, the standard 495 language. So an individual who's been violated under this section can bring a private right of action? Under 495, yes, yes. And damages would be, how would you calculate damages in a case like this? So, you know, I think if, if the argument would have to be for damages that I was the most qualified except that they chose not to hire me because um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to play this out a little bit. Um, because they found out I was earning X amount less. Yeah, I, I don't see many private right of actions on this. I see potentially, you know, AG's claims um, to try to suss out, you know, using us as the, as the mechanism, enforcement mechanism to suss out whether an employer is unlawfully asking this question, more so than I would see someone seeing the viability of a private right of action. So that's a public right of action when the AG acts for a class of people or for, on behalf of a whole bunch. It's an enforcement mechanism. So right. we have the ability, if uh, under the laws we currently enforce, if an employee comes to us with a belief that there's a violation of one of the laws we enforce, we can, um, if, we, if we also believe there's potentially a violation issue, a charge of discrimination to that employer and investigate the scenario. So it's like ban the box, um, which, you know, passed a couple of years ago, I, you know, I'm not aware there's been any private right of actions based on ban the box. Right. We've seen a couple cases where employee or potential employees have just come to us and said, this was on the application. I think I didn't get the job because of it. And we've then looked into that um, to see whether, you know, whether there was any basis But it's not supposed that. to be on the application. Well, that's why well right. And so that's us. why they reported that for us for enforcement. Right. I mean, you know, we... we good. It's good they were so, aware enough to do that. Right. And so I see this more along the lines of, of that. I would see it harder. But if, there may be cases where there would be... Yeah, it uh, sounds kind of hard. I mean, right, so right, right. the employee complains, they ask me about past salary history. You know at that point, there's probably not going to be an employment relationship in the future at that point. So right. the right. question is, mm -hmm. can they damages that they would have gotten a job and they lost wages, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But you, it's a, a practice that you want to see, you are now required to see enforced, so you may go after this employer and get some insurance and discontinuance, stuff like that. Right. Uh, have you, can you get back to us with, examples where you've effectively done that under this law in other areas that we've passed? Uh, examples of where we've stopped a practice or? Yeah. Well, you've gone after an employer. We've got all these employment laws and we have this. Oh, employer. I mean, we do it. We have 70, approximately 70 pending charges right now, all based on laws under, essentially all under 495. Um, and, and, and most of our, if we do settle a case, it involves an, an assurance of discontinuance, essentially, that, you know, they will no longer uh, agree that, you know, they act in compliance with. Well, I guess, I guess I'd just like to hear some of the examples of where you've successfully gotten. Stories. You like to share stories. Sure. Um, <laughs> no, you don't do right now. Yeah, you know, okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. I, can, I can come up with some of those for my okay. group. Thank you. Yes. Have you finished your initial comments on this bill? Because I have a question for you on the wage discrimination piece. Um, sure. My only other piece I was going to speak to was other protected categories. But why don't we go to your question first? No. Uh, you okay. know, in our uh, pay equity bill 275, yes. we include amending the Fair Employment Practices Act to expand the wage discrimination, right. which we're addressing here to all protected classes. Right. So I would just like your, you know, to me that uh, is is the, one of the last fixes we need to make to this section of law, and so I was just curious what your... So our office's concern with that is we are supportive of pay equity with regards to sex and, and race. Um, we do have some concerns... But this doesn't address race. It should, if it's all protected categories. Well, all protected do if we included that, but it doesn't with this oh. at the moment. So you know, no, I'm speaking to I'm speaking okay, to your yeah to that your, piece. right the, the other bill. Um, we do have some concerns when it comes to um, 
more non-visible protected categories because employers may not know if someone has a disability or someone's uh, country of origin and to have an affirmative law that they provide equal pay for that work based on something that may not be ascertainable may provide an incentive for employers to start to more actively um, classify their employees or, or take note of those things. But if they're so, not allowed to ask about it. So if they're not allowed to ask about it. Right, which is what we're getting. Then to. how can they know that they're... Um, well, because you might know if somebody came to an interview in a wheelchair. Well, right, but how can you know if someone who has a hidden disability, how can you know then that you are in compliance with that law if you don't even know But you can't it? ask about it. I mean, the whole point is to protect them by not asking what's not evident. You can't ask further. So, do you have some unknown or non-visible disability that we haven't addressed? We, I mean, it's like, you're not going to do that, but you might if it is a visible disability. I mean, the, un, the unseen things, you're never going to know. People's mental health, you're not going to know necessarily when you hire them. But, right. And I, uh, and I think that... You don't know if they're... You know, there are all sorts of things you don't, aren't going to know until you work with them. Sometimes they're apparent. That's true. Happily. Some of us wear ourselves off. Sometimes more frequently. <laughs> right. So, so, I mean, I think you're... But you are providing support for the concern I'm trying to explain, which is that, um, you know, right now, uh, companies, you know, often will do equal pay audits where they already know the sex of their employees and they're comparing, okay, I'm making sure my men and my women are aligned. Do I need to fix anyone here? To then add in categories that you're not supposed to ask about, you, you don't know about. Well, or that you may know about, but that you can't discriminate with wage discrimination about to then do those same balancing when you don't know the full scope of who you're balancing or you're not supposed to know the full scope is a slippery slope. And that's just it's something, if, if you choose to add that back in, you know, Julio and I can give you further testimony on that. But right now, you know, pay and race are things that employers generally... There's no race here. In 294 as it is now, there is I'm no talking about 275. 275. Right, but 275, <laughs> race is an apparent one. Sometimes. Sometimes, not always. Like, you know, there might be discrimination about Hungarians. You aren't going to necessarily know that when you first interview section. But you will know if somebody comes with a, you know, with a physical handicap or with some other protected, some obvious way they present or they dress or they whatever. You do not want to have wage discrimination uh, based on that. Sure, and I and I think that that's also already protected under um, a current employment law that you're not going to discriminate against someone based on um, their their handicap. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I we we don't evidently have it, which is why we had included it to it, to include all protected classes. We don't currently have that law, we or we wouldn't be asking for it. No, we don't. Okay, we don't protected classes. Damien says we so don't. Have I will tell you, we would take the case if we had a person who had a physical disability that came to our office and said, um, I believe my employer chose to pay me less because I'm an individual with a disability. We would take that as a violation of current Vermont law. And, and similarly, you would take it as a violation of current Vermont law if they said, based upon my sex, I'm getting paid less. Right. Have you had cases like that? Yes. Okay. Have they been resolved favorably? To the complaint? I, I mean, we've had numerous cases like that, and some have resolved, some have gone on to go to suit. Um, yeah, those are, that's a very frequent but that's claim that we an see. onerous, that's a burden to put on people to have to take action. I'd rather protect them up front and prevent it. Right, but even with the protection up front, they still might have to. Right, I, I understand. I understand. I just, you know, if we're, if, if we're protected, anyway. I'm not arguing against the bill. Go on. It's that this is one one level of protection, but we can assume that people are still going to have to follow it and be vigilant and educate people. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Kids and all this. We we are not going to be able to make this all encompassing. I I know that's what you want to do, but you know this is a good start, and let's make sure that we uh, you know get this right. Without saying you can't do anything. 
Or we could add times infinity at the end. Times infinity. Wow, that's just. That's, how, that that's how it's set at my house with my seven year old. <laughs> Mine too. Yeah, Any other questions for me? No. But are you enjoying? Thank you. Thank you. Are you enjoying working with? Views on H two ninety four and actually, I assume that your views are those of the administration. So if you could yes. <clears throat> yes, Beth Fastidge, you the Commissioner of Human Resources, and overall, it looks like um, you know. First, I looked at it from the perspective of, of an employer because we're the largest employer in the state of Vermont, and. Um, from that perspective, we really don't have any issue with that, um, uh, with anything in the anything in this in this uh, proposed legislation. Did you testify in the house? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we testified, and um, Doug, actually, Doug Pine, the director, deputy director of recruitment, um, testified um, that. You know, talked about our employment practices and what we go through, and and and, and so it doesn't seem to be an issue for for us. We should be able to um, conform to any of those. And overall, um, it seems like um, I can't really speak for other businesses. I think you've heard from some perhaps other business organizations, but. Um, and we were just having a little side discussion about salary history and who asks for particular, you know, and who asks for um, salary history. And actually, I was just told that the folks at the Commission of Women were actually offered, were actually required to provide salary histories when they were getting their job offer, which was surprising to both Doug and I. So we're trying to figure that out and make, figure out what happened there and why that was happening. It's a little bit different hiring process, probably because they're at a board. But I want to make sure that, um, you know, if we, as the Department of Human Resources, we don't do all the recruitment and screening for everybody across state government. So if this law is enacted once in this place, we'll have to make sure that we put that information out there so that hiring managers understand what is legal and what's not legal. So I think that would be our biggest um, issue in the implementation is just making sure that, um, especially when, if DHR is not in control of that process, that people who are doing the hiring are aware of the laws. Would you be willing to talk with your prior life's hat on as a large employer in Vermont, whether either your company or other companies you knew did do this as a practice, and whether you found it valuable, or losing this would be a concern? I think as a large employer, this. For most large employers, this wouldn't be an issue. I don't think that's something that I, I don't know if people ask for salary histories. I think it, it can inform what you can offer and what you think that employee will take. And I can understand, um, based on some other testimony that I've heard, why that could potentially um, have women or people that weren't making a higher salary previously in a previous job keep them at a lower salary. Um, and, you know, obviously, as an employer, you might want to, you know, it's kind of a competitive market out there. You want to pay people what, you know, you want to pay people what what will make them happy and what they will accept the job for, but you don't want to pay them more than you need to. So um, I, I don't know how other employers negotiate salaries. Typically, there's a salary range, and um, that's the negotiation once the job is offered, not usually before the offer. I mean, I don't think you go, don't usually go up to an interview saying, I'm only going to take this job if you pay me so much, and the employer doesn't say. You know, I think that people t generally talk about salary after a job offer has been made. or um, yeah. So I don't, I, don't, I don't see this as, a, as, a, as an issue in particularly in larger companies. In smaller companies, I think any time small businesses do have um, more of a challenge in that um, there are a lot of laws and there are a lot of things that they're supposed to follow and do that they're not necessarily aware of, and it could be a one-person shop that is, um, you know, just trying to. Well, they're going to offer yeah. what they can offer. So, I mean, it, it, they don't need to find out what somebody's salary history is. They can offer what they can afford. Or it may be a conversation. Could be a conversation of, you know, where I meet you out to dinner or whatever, and you're talking about someone where they work, and they're saying, oh, I don't really like where I work, or I don't make this much money, and, and they find out a little bit more about this person, like, oh, well, maybe you want to come to work for me, no, already knowing the salary 
history. That's okay too. But that's I, you know. There's nothing that with that stops an employer from uh, asking. It just gives the you know wait the person no, shouldn't really. ask. But it's there's nothing that prevents an, a prospective employee from divulging. It just prevents the future employer from asking. Right, but they may have, may have maybe already asked out in the bar, like, hey, what are you making well, your well, job then, now? I can pay you more over here. But then there it is. That's out there. I, mean, I, think, does, I don't I think, think that does anything to do in, with In this. small business, I think that type of thing happens more often than not. So, I mean, my perspective is we want to be careful about all the little things that we um, impose kind of on small businesses that make it more difficult to operate in Vermont. Um, I don't see this in particular as being something that... Um, this is onerous. It doesn't seem to be onerous. It, it's in the category of one more thing, but I think it's for a good reason. I think that we have a good reason to do it, and it's important that um, women are paid the same as men. And you can see after years and years and years, you look at the disparity in pay, and it's still there. So. I don't know if this is going to do the trick or not. <laughs> but it's one good tool. But it's, it seems like That's a good a tool, and I think it's sure. it's the notification to employers and how they're going to how they know that that they should follow this. I think it's it's more about that. So you, you, you said something that raises this uh, prickly subsection B here. Um, you said that. In most instances, the job is offered and then salary is discussed afterwards. Concerning about this. Um, so if that's the case, if I read subsection B, it, it, it does say has made an offer of employment with compensation. So when, are you saying that in most cases the job is offered with a figure and then there's a negotiation that takes place afterwards, or just as a job is offered and then we'll discuss well, how we do it at the state of Vermont, uh, usually a job offer doesn't come without a salary associated with it. Um, and that's the time when the, somebody just says, well, I really can't work for that much, or I'm going to need to make this much, or in my past job I made this much, or I think that I should make this. So that's usually once the job offer is made, it's usually offered with it. It tends to be offered with a salary, unless you're just going to say, how would you like to work here? What what salary do you require? So that depends on the employer and how they do it and how they're negotiating salary. It's very easy at the state of Vermont because we have, have a lot of different employee pay plans and we're very structured on the salaries and what we offer. So it makes it very easy for us to, it make it relatively easy for us to conform to this law, whether more than it might for an employer that's not so structured and especially not so structured in their salaries. Okay. I'll just be a, a concern with that section in the sense of if you could meet that section by saying, uh, we're offering you the job, what compensation would you like? And then they tell them what they would like, and then they say, okay, we want to check with your former employer to see if this is in the range of what you previously make, whether they can do an end run around this. Because then if the person says no, it's not going to lead to a really good employment relationship probably. The person probably going to say yes, and then you're back to square one. Uh, I mean, I think that in, in, at that point, um, if you were able, if, if an employee is going to disclose something and they're actually lying to you, you would want to be able to, if they're going to say, I made this in my last job, versus this is what I think that I should make for this, or this is what I want, this, this is the salary that would take that would take me to maybe change careers and come to work for you. Um, you might need to make more because you might like your old job. They might have to pay you X amount mo more money to hire you. Um, but if an, I think that if somebody is saying that this is what I used to make, and they're lying to an employer about that, you probably don't want to hire somebody that's being dishonest. I mean, that's, you know, if, if someone's, if someone's gonna, stating I'm, I'm the gonna, reason that they make, such, yeah. We're going to ask Dr. about this section, but if we struck subsection B, do you see that in any way being problematic? Struck subsection B. Yeah. We're just struggling as to why that's we don't think it's really necessary. 
And I have concerns about it because it would be an easy backdoor to getting saying, oh, you know, the controller has said we can't really afford this. Yeah, but even without that, they still can do that. The controller's going to say they can't afford it yeah. anyway. I mean, well, no, maybe be not, not if they've offered a job already with a set salary. Who would offer a job with a salary that wasn't approved by the fund? You know, like. Yeah. I'm just saying, that's what this allows. That's what this allows. This allows a person to offer a job with a set salary and then renege on it. They can do that at any time. I know, but this gives them the green light to do that. I mean, this gives them more of a green light to do All that. All this does is give them the green light if someone lied and said, I was making $75,000 at this, so I need to make at least $80,000. And then it turns out that they were making $40,000 then do you want somebody that's lying to work Hopefully for you? Hopefully you figured that out in the interviewing process. Well, the character well, of the person. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah. You know, interviews are very short, and, you know, and that's no, why you do multiple interviews. interviews. And, you know, you, it's, you can make a bad hire through a very thorough inter interviewing process and don't find it out till later. I mean, that's very, yeah. that's, it's, it's very possible, and it's very, you know, it depends on who the interviewer and how you're doing it. So I would... The kind of, I mean, I think that the section is good. It gives people, if they want to confirm the wages, and someone's certainly disclosed that. I, I think it. I, I don't think that you would have as much support from the business community without that there. How often would you confirm someone's salary history, saying, "I'm going to, you know, sixty-five thousand dollars is, and you agree on the job." And then you'd go back to confirm how much they made prior to that. I, I would think that you're going to focus your efforts on doing reference checks, right? Rather than yep. salary confirmation. I, I agree. Uh, we don't go back and you don't confirm other people's yeah, salaries. So far, you I might confirm it. You know, if it's a, someone you're hiring that's worked publicly before and their salaries online. I mean, you can go to the state of Vermont website and see what people are making. Exactly. But that's not, you can't but normally do that. Your reference, you normally do references well before you make an offer. I, I think I've gone back the other way. And, and correct me if I'm looking at this uh, from a prospective uh, employer. So that if someone uses their prior salary history in negotiations, okay, Phil, I'd like to hire you, right? Um, you know, the range is 60 to 75,000. And you say, in my previous job, without him asking, I made 75000 so I need to make at least that uh, in order to, to make the move. So then, uh, if we remove B, they don't have the ability to confirm how much you made in your previous it's job. It's You could. It's silent on it. it. You could. There's nothing that prevents you from it. There's nothing in law that prevents you from doing that. Well, it says seek the salary history of the employee. If that's not there, there's, there's nothing there. that prevents you. Yeah. From it says it, you can't seek says, the salary on four. Seek the salary history of a prospective employee it, from his or it current says, or former employer. Uh, so with it throughout the whole process, that's, that's you're right. Okay. Ben, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, do we you have something? I flip flop back you're the other way. Yes. Do you have something to add, Doug, or... On the list, I'm just I think so. I think in our in our hiring process, um, I think this would have very little impact. Yeah. Um, we don't ask for previous salary in any of our applications. Um, in our, as Beth said, we have a fairly structured salary plan, so um, they know up front what the starting salary is going to be. Um, there are uh, any any time that we might. Um, Inquire about a salary would be if uh, we did a hiring to range. That is, there was some negotiation, but that's post conditional offer. So um, that would be fine the way this law is written. Okay. Thank you. You know, I did realize though, in looking at this, is that my uh, employment applications, which I've had, I've been there 13 years and I inherited them. Uh, all do include, you know, your job history of previous pay on all the applications. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. 
and I don't necessarily, and I don't really look at that, or nor do I. I care if you're qualified to, you know. Sure. You just have to update them. So you have to get some time. To yeah. Right. Like this should have been done a hundred years ago. Time to move it. Oh, you are good at I, I love to entertain. <laughs> That's very true. I do I? I don't like well, to. Farmers can. Oh, oh, well, I'm a theater producer. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Rescuing you for minimum wage, I understand. I was in the middle of some scintillating economic testimony, and I was. I was loath to leave, but when I heard it was this bill, I became excited again. Yeah, yeah, so excited you came I'm, I'm trying to channel Tucker here, and I'm just not. Oh, this is Tucker's bill? For no, 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 no. Um, just Tucker's, yeah, Tucker's, kind, Tucker's of kind of humor, oh, okay. yes. Um, so uh, I'm not very successful at that. I'm better if I just play the straight man. <laughs> you know, that's one of Tucker's great gifts, is his humor. And, it's true. And it's his true. interest in history. Yes. So, what, what is the history of this bill in the House? <laughs> so, I, I actually have the, the marked up version from the House, um, with the exception of a slight change in the section numbering, because we continue to add to our uh, 21 VSA 495s. This is a yeah, we, we squeezed the Employee, Fair Employment Practices Act into two small areas, so we're having to add letters, and we're up to M with this one and N with another bill. Um, and I, we might even be up to O this year. Um, but the only thing that was added in this House, apart from that, was that nothing in this section shall be construed to prevent an employer from subsection C at the bottom there where you would inquire about expectations or requirements or provide information about uh, compensation that's offered with the position. Um, and then the effective date was updated because this bill was introduced last year. Uh, to the discussion that was going on uh, as I walked in the room here about inquiring about, um, about subsection B of the bill, I might just note that in Senator Clarkson's bill, there's a slightly different wording of that that may also get at the same, uh, yes, there same is. sort of goal. It would um, be great to use that instead. And it basically, <laughs> uh, yes. I'm not very proud um, of this B. So what it what it says in that bill, which is S two seventy five. It's interesting how you pivoted on that. Section which you said was awful. Slight variation is now great. <laughs> Were you the drafter of that one as well? I don't, yes. I was hoping you'd appreciate yeah. that. So it's you a, a little bit better in her version than you were this one? Is that what we're doing? more invested uh, in our version. Maybe the solution we're looking for. <laughs> Could be. So, uh, as a proud father to all my bills, no bill is better than any other. And They're the proud just father different of and unique. Two daughters who you want to have be paid equitably. All right, what is, what, okay. what is the other so, thing? <laughs> you're, you're trying to get me to say things that could be seen as advocating. So. Right, which is not your um, job. So what, what that page. bill says, it's on page six, and it says uh, the, the operative language is if a prospective employee voluntarily discloses information about his or her current or past compensation, the employer uh, may seek to confirm or request that the prospective employee confirm that information. Yes. Um, Which is why I was misspoke actually a little bit ago. I said, oh, but they have the opportunity. You know, this doesn't prevent them from voluntarily disclosing it. This just confirms that they have the ability to voluntarily disclose but it. I, I, I sort of get antsy around the word voluntarily because it's like when we were looking at whether an employer could make you give up your passwords. For, uh, for your social media, which has become a big issue. The employers were saying they're doing it voluntarily. The, the applicants were saying, I'm getting signals that I'm not going to get the job if I don't voluntarily do this. So here, you could say, you know, the other people we've been seeing earlier this week were all willing to take 75 and under. Um, right. And then 
You so know what did you make? For yeah, you know what you're supposed to do yeah. at that point. Yeah. So or not. One, one way point. to address that may be just to blend the two. Um, and I'm, I'm just offering options here. Um, and it would basically be to say, leave in that initial language after an employer has made an offer of employment with compensation to a prospective employee. Uh, if the employee Disclose. voluntarily disclosed information about his or her current or past compensation, the employer may seek to confirm or request that the prospective employee confirm that information because they still are at that prospective employee stage at that point. Um, but if you add in the language after you've made an offer of employment with compensation uh, and then the clarifying if the employee uh, had disclosed uh, information about their current Sounds or good. past wages. This way it doesn't necessarily impact the offer, but it gives the employer the ability to check if they feel that there's something. Yeah, and if the employee, prospective employees made the choice to disclose that information during the interview or application you know, process, um, I assume it would be during the interview process where they say, you know, $10 is great, uh, I'd like to make 11 and the employer says, okay, I'll offer you 11, um, can you just provide me with confirmation okay. that you're currently making All right, so 11. you can draft that up that way and I want to talk just a little bit more because I'd like to do it like a, if, if people are amenable, I would take a strong on this. I'm going to want to take, I feel, to move us along, I want to take a bunch of straw votes, but because there's so many moving parts, I'm not comfortable with bringing bills up yet to the calendar, but uh, I'd like to at least get people uh, semi uh, locked in to or get uh, people to get our bills semi locked in to the final version so when they're ready to reach the floor for strategic purposes and others will have them ready to go. Yes. Um, so, and then I guess this is to the committee, but also to Damien. When I look at this, it doesn't say that uh, an employer can't ask somebody what they make. It says that you can't screen a perspective. I guess it depends on what your definition of screen is. Uh, a prospective employee. It just doesn't say that you can't unless it's a, we. To seek also. Seek the salary history so of a prospective employee. Why don't they just use the word ask? Or, no, it says of an, it says seek the salary history of a prospective employee from his or her current uh, or former right, employee. You pointed that out earlier. Yeah. We had some language in there to say seek the right. salary history. From. I just wanted to make sure that that was in there. So what I was thinking uh, was seek the salary history instead of of a prospective employee from a per prospective employee, and then see the or or from his or her current or former. Okay, so, so yeah, seek the seek salary history or information from a prospective employee or his or her current or former employer. Correct. Okay, and when yeah. we talked about that, Davey, we talked about that possibly we went back and forth in lieu of uh, of number one, but there may be a reason to keep number one as well. So just want your thoughts on that. But now we're saying you can't ask the person or collect it from his former employer. Uh, do we need number one, or is number one essentially the heart of the intense section of the bill? Um, so I see number one as a um, closing potential loopholes. If you're saying you can't seek salary history from a prospective employer or from her, his or her current uh, employer, um, you know, what What one is basically doing is if the employee says during the interview, uh, you know, basically voluntarily reveals salary information, right. um, you can't screen them out just based on that. Um, but you could you say, well... Screen them, out, screen them out from a job offer or screen in terms of what you offer? It, yeah, it's... Uh, so it just says screen a prospective employee based on his or her wages. It's not, it's ambiguous about 
what screening would would necessarily entail. To me, it, it uh, would be screening based for an offer. Um, could we combine them? They seem a little redundant. So why couldn't yeah. we ask? I mean, we're trying to get the or a screen. Past salary history has no relationship to the job offer or what you're offered. Why right. can't we just say that? Um, See, I look at screen as interview. Well, choosing to have an interview. Choosing to have an interview, choosing to continue the interview. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. it's, uh, uh, you know, so there are, in interviewing, you may have, you know, questions where you divert to the end if the answer is not what you're looking for. Uh, and that could be, you know, something about their qualifications, something about, um, it, you know, it, it, there are a number of things that an employer may be looking for in an employee, and when they see the employee, the prospective employee lacks a certain qualification, uh, you know, or maybe um, comes off badly in their interview, they may just cut to the end rather than spend the full hour interviewing the individual. Um, could we? So that, that could also be covered by screening. Um, can you put, can you combine them? Because they do seem redundant. And also, quite honestly, I'd love to see whatever we decide. I'd love to see number four first. Because to me, that's the big shall not. I'd leave with uh, our top, our top, top choice. Do you have that gum? I'm like, oh, here. Want them? So, um. Big ass, right up front. I think we can probably do. Uh, was this borrowed from another state and lost the word screen? Because I think we're all interpreting screen in different Yeah, ways. there is, there is we, ambiguity. It, it shows some lack of clarity. So if we're after saying, you know, you can't, the interview can't go in a certain direction because of the past history, or the job offer can't be based upon past history, or the amount of the offer can't be based, why can't we say all three of those as opposed to the word screen? Mm -hmm. but that's what this, that's what this bill is about. We should say no job offer or the amount of the offer or the conduct of the interview shall be based upon the past history. Well, you so, can't ask for it either. I mean, it can't be based on it. Well, that's four. For four you can't ask for. Mm -hmm. now, it, one is the intent of the decision making. Right. You can't be put in another pile because. So you would want to say screen in it. Screen a prospective employee, uh, or basically determine whether or not to condition the offer or the nature of the offer based upon past. And that that's in um, that's really covered by three, I guess. So you're saying condition an offer mm -hmm. Oops, yeah. of employment or an interview on uh, no. Pass. See, see, I I think Senator Susie's point comes up in three is um, again it says it says that a prospective employer disclose I mean this bill in addition to limiting access to the information is if you do have the information from one source or another you still can't consider that information and the Attorney General told us that that's the business they're in looking at mm -hmm. intent in those kinds of Situation, so we don't really have in yeah, other, so other than the word screen the basic intent of the bill that you can't deny a person a job based upon their past history or lowball their offer based upon a past history. Yeah, I think um, you could rewrite this to say uh, you cannot, you know, seek the salary history of a prospective. Seek a prospective employee's salary history from him or her, her or from his or her former current or former employer. Um, uh, request or, or you know require. Uh, let me think here. Um, or condition an interview. Um, condition uh, an interview or an offer of employment or anything like that based on salary information from an employer. Or consider. Uh, an employee's salary history or information uh, in determining whether to uh, grant an interview, make an offer of employment. Um, and then finally, 
uh, require that a prospective employee's prior wages satisfy minimum or maximum criteria. And I think you would get at everything in there, but in three sections. Okay, so let me um, let me ask this one question because it's still a little nagging for me. I want to know what the committee feels. I mean, that's then you can go back and write this up. It'll be a fairly tight bill. I'm still concerned with the person who um, uh, you haven't heard this before. The person who wants who who wear the salary is not as big a deal as getting the, in terms of getting the job and wants to say either this is what I made and I only need to make five dollars more and I'll be happy and I know you're offering more than that but I really want this job does that matter to you can they reach that agreement I don't want to prohibit that scenario from happening because basically I think we, we tighten this bill enough that um, basically saying you can never consider past salary or, or or maybe it's different past salary versus what the person's requiring. So you're basically saying uh, if an employee says I'm willing to take less right. than anyone else because I want to work for you so badly. Right. There's nothing that prevents that. Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, I think that's covered by um, C, which says inquiring about a prospective employee's salary expectations or, requiring, or requirements or providing information about the wages and compensation. Okay. We could say inquiring or about or discussing. Okay, so essentially employees. the stuff we were talking about up until this point about not having access to wage history and not using wage history in any kind of decision making would still allow for the scenario that, that I was just talking about. Yeah. So it's basically um, not wage history. It's just basically saying someone coming in saying I'll I'll voluntarily take less. Yeah, I mean in that case it would basically be the person saying, I don't need sixty five thousand, I'm happy with sixty thousand. And they're not saying, you know, it's it's not a question of the employer saying, Well, I know you only got forty five thousand now, would you be willing to take less than everyone else and then I can offer this to you? Uh, it's it's instead the employee would be the one that's saying. Do you, you think know, it, okay, do you think you have enough to I write it at this point? I think so. When do you need the draft back? What's your um, timeline? Whenever, whenever you can get it to us, but I just want to know if the committee. I sort of pushed the direction a little bit here. So I want to just, just move it along. Are people pretty much okay with that direction? Obviously, subject to see if it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So change, change subsection A uh, and B. Yeah, so A and B, and then, and so do it as a strike call? Sure. Okay. Um, and I, today is a little bit tight, but um, I should be able to have it for you for tomorrow or Friday. Great. Okay. I'll just send it to you when it's ready. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have any... Um, Chris, can I just ask Amy one more question about the protected classes? Sure. So um, you had pointed out to me initially, which is one of the reasons we included it in 275, that all protected classes were not subject to the same wage salary history stuff. Right. They weren't subject to the same protections. So um, do, do you still feel that that's an additional true-up that's needed in this section, or... Um, the AG's office didn't seem to feel the imperative the way I, 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 I did. think so I think um, to go back to our conversations when we were working on on your bill uh, the the true up I think is not necessarily that the law doesn't protect people because the you're already protected from discrimination based on all of these things the equal pay law um, provides a little bit more specificity specifically related to discrimination and pay on the basis of gender. Um, so by adding all the protected classes, I think you add some clarity that it applies to everyone, but I think that the anti-discrimination laws already cover you if you're saying, I pay less to people of national origin X because they're from, of national origin X, you're already discriminating on the basis of national origin. Or if I pay less to people of a certain religion, 
you're already discriminating on the basis of that religion. Um, there were concerns expressed about this when the House looked at your bill, um, in that it might be just muddying the waters when we already have discrimination protections in place for them. So, so um, are you saying this wouldn't substantively add to protections for some people? Yeah, I don't think it would substantively okay. add substantively right. add to I the mean, protections, and I think. If I understood the Attorney General's office's concerns, that was part of it. Um, there is that it's not really adding anything, but it can muddy the waters. Um, right. So, yeah, it's, it was a true up that other states thought was important to make, but I think our discrimination protections are already there. Right. Great. Okay. Good. I will get to work on that and Help come back when you guys take up 707 in a little bit. Joining us on short notice, we had a little 20 minute break, and I, I know you've approached me before, and other people have said you had a message to deliver on this bill. Yes. Right. So why don't you go for Representative Sarah Copeland hands us for the record. Um, thank you so much for making a little bit of time for me this morning. I appreciate being fit into the gap in your schedule. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the, the bill and, and just kind of frame up the, the rationale for, for why the components you see in front of you are in here and also talk a little bit about a few things that were either removed or, um, or hadn't, quite, um, hadn't quite fully baked uh, before the bill left the House that you might consider um, in your deliberations on the bill. Um, you have had a walkthrough of the bill, and, and, I, and I gather that you've gotten all the way through so you understand what each of the components are, although m my report was that you had been absent for the walkthrough of the bill. So, um, so feel free to ask me questions if you, uh, okay. if you don't yep. understand um, some component of the bill that I'm talking about. Um, you know, I, th I think in, in doing the research and talking to the broad range of people who contributed to this bill, I think what, what has become really uh, clear to me is that cultural change is needed. Um, that there are, given, given the number of um, people who report having been sexually harassed in the workplace, um, we, we still are not doing a very good job of figuring out how to put an end to that. Um, there's a number of different things that we could do to, to try to respond to this illegal behavior in the workplace, uh, but, but the components that you see before you are really the ones that, um, that a broad group of us felt were not going to swing the pendulum in the other direction, not change the definition of, of what constitutes harassment or change the, the, you know, the way that you prove harassment but really just try to remove some of the barriers that people who've been harassed have in terms of being able to put an end to that harassment. And my hope is, and I think the hope of a lot of us who've been really thinking deeply about this, is to, um, you know, in this era where people are now uh, willing to talk openly about harassment in the workplace, to try to move that timeline back to a point before the harassment becomes uh, pervasive and, um, and, and something that might be subject of a lawsuit or, um, or a sexual harassment settlement in the workplace. But do some things that really, uh, you know, kind of level the playing field and encourage people to make that report uh, earlier and encourage employers to, uh, to, to try to change the culture within the workplace that might allow harassing behavior to happen. Um, n nobody wants to bring a lawsuit or um, or a claim, you know, through a, a, a private attorney, uh, and uh, and seek a settlement. It it really is only the cases um, I think where there's something out of balance, and so that's part of the reason why this uh, seeks to to uh, bring things more into balance. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of. Uh, spots in the bill that I think are particularly important. Um, the pre-employment agreements, I think, uh, I think you, you are uh, familiar with the rationale for uh, making sure that pre-employment agreements don't prohibit somebody from being able to seek remedies in the event that they are um, sexually harassed in the workplace. 
Uh, there are questions around whether binding arbitration is appropriate in those cases, and um, and and there are other uh, there are other solutions to the binding arbitration question that are being worked on um, in the legislature this year. Uh, so I think that's kind of a you know keep a note in the back of your mind. But with respect to uh, sexual harassment settlement agreements, so this is the point in the in the, the work relationship where the harassment has gotten pervasive enough, the employee has made a complaint, the employer, um, for a variety of reasons, agrees to enter into a settlement with that employee. Um, and then what is contained in that settlement contract is really um, what's at issue. And, and I think it's really important to make sure that things that are contained in those settlement agreements are not allowing the employer to pass along the harasser and allow the harasser to continue that behavior. And right now, the pendulum is uh, is really kind of in the other direction in in a couple of places uh, that really actually disadvantages the, the person who has uh, who has reported the illegal behavior, the victim of harassment, as opposed to the uh, the person who's doing the harassment. What um, does the, the settlement agreement look like? I mean, have you seen them? Uh, you know, what are like the major components of the typical? Settlement. So I, I am not a lawyer, so I haven't seen them. Uh, but I understand from the lawyers that I've talked to that you know they can cover a, a they can be very simple and straightforward. Um, you know, no admission of of uh, of somebody's culpability or guilt um, is is necessary. Um, typically, the a settlement agreement would contain some sort of a monetary. Um, payout um, and would require the person who brought that complaint to agree that okay we're settled and done this this incident is over non-disclosure and um, most times they do have non-disclosure agreements and, and and you know some people some people and indeed some states are looking at eliminating non-disclosure agreements making them illegal and against public policy um, we did not do that in this bill because we really felt that there are times when it benefits both the person who's been harassed and the employer and the person who's done the harassing to to keep it quiet and move on um, yes. and, and that's where my question comes in so this is page three and it says near the bottom an agreement to settle sexual harassment complaint shall expressly state that it does not prohibit, prevent, or otherwise restrict the employee from doing either of the following, the first of which is lodging a complaint with the Attorney General and the State's Attorney. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, is the purpose to allow a settlement that will, in effect, settle civil claims, but nothing beyond that? So in other words, if I'm the company operating on behalf of an employee or the employee who's accused of harassment. My motivation for a settlement is to, is to settle, right? To, as you said, to be done with this. Um, but it seems like that's prohibited here. So there, there would be no, no settlement if we pass this but where you could truly be done with it because the person would, they would take the money and then they would still have the option of so bringing a criminal complaint. This is actually um, really just putting in plain language in this bill uh, what is already a truth in law, which is that you you cannot be required to sign a contract that says you can't call the cops, essentially. You can't be prohibited from calling the attorney general or uh, or lodging a complaint. What, what, what the... What this does, though, is it specifies that you can't double dip. You know, I can't, I can't enter into a sexual harassment settlement with my employer and get a monetary settlement, and then go to the AG's office and, and get another monetary settlement. But I, but I might have reasons to go to the AG's office if, uh, you know, if what I'm, what I have seen or experienced um, constitutes more than. Uh, simple harassment goes it goes into sexual assault, or in in uh, you know the case of some of the things that I wanted to talk with you all about. If if the victim of sexual harassment sees her harasser continuing to uh, to to prey on other victims, um, and that's really an important. I'm still part of this. confused about 
you know, there are settlements going on all the time like this. So all of those settlements still allow the person who settles and signs, and even signs non-disclosure, to go to the Human Rights Commission, the AG, to on, on the incident forward which they settled about? That yeah, so doesn't you, seem like there's any impetus to settle then. I don't know. So the, the settlement agreements typically waive your remedies. Um, so you once you've settled, you say, I'm waiving all my rights to seek a remedy for, uh, you know, and it, often the settlement agreements, they're not just going to say my claim of sexual harassment. They're going to say claims of sexual harassment and this and this and this and this. Um, so anything that might be related that occurred at any time from the beginning of time until the date of the settlement. But when you say remedies, so remedies, so personally under Vermont statute, if I was sexually harassed, I could seek uh, a variety of damages, uh, potentially lost wages, uh, attorney's fees, court costs. Um, uh, I could seek injunctive relief, so an order from the court that the employer stop doing something or do something, um, take an affirmative action to remedy the situation. Um, and when I sign a settlement agreement, what I'm waiving is my right to pursue my own remedies. The state has a separate remedy that the state can pursue on behalf of the public generally. But if they need you to make a complaint, would the non-disclosure agreement, for instance? Well, the, the Attorney General's office could subpoena somebody. Um, right. In the event that there was a future claim by someone else. Well, but shy, shy of that. And there, there have been is, is there? Uh, so the, the the basic question is now. Where are you? Uh, this is having to do with page three near the bottom. Now, if I'm a determined settler, can I write a contract that prevents the harassed person who's settling with me from going, say, to the Human Rights Commission? Or, I mean, assuming that they voluntarily sign. As a matter of public policy, no, you cannot. You, there are settlement agreements that seem to purport to do that. As a matter of public policy, the courts have routinely struck down those agreements. So, so I might think that I'm getting that protection, but then the person could litigate it later. Right. So, what's typically in the, the cases I've read on this, and I haven't seen one from our circuit, the Second Circuit, but there was uh, a case recently in the First Circuit um, that I read on this. And basically, what happened is the employer signed settlements agreements with a number of employees who experienced a, a hostile working environment. Uh, a future employee sought to bring. Uh, a case, basically a complaint, based on their experience and was aware that other individuals in the office had suffered harassment mm -hmm. uh, and basically told the enforcement agency about them. The enforcement agency sought them out and they said, yes, this was supposed to stop. We want to testify. And the employer tried to prevent them from testifying and participating in the investigation, sought to enforce their non-disclosure agreement to prevent them from talking to the enforcement agency. It went up to the First Circuit Court of Appeals, which said, no, it's a matter of public policy. You can't contract away the right of the state to enforce the law. Well, but, right. that's different. but again, that's, yeah. that's indirectly somebody hears, maybe. Then they're subpoenaed. I can see how the subpoena would. Um, these were these were individuals who wanted to voluntarily testify. But could could they uh, forget the future? Statement. Could they sign the, the agreement and then the next day go to the Human Rights Commission, lodge a public complaint against the person that they just signed? So, what they could do is make the Human Rights Commission aware of basically complaint about the behavior. They can't pursue. The Human Rights Commission will typically pursue remedies on your behalf, as well as potentially the civil penalties and statute. Same as the Attorney General, they can pursue, uh, you know, a, a, a 
standard penalty for doing an unlawful act, as well as other remedies for the person mm -hmm. who's lodged the complaint. Uh, what a settlement is going to say is that you can't, you're, you're waiving all your rights to pursue any other penalties through any other forum. Um, but that you're not, you can't waive the state's right to pursue a penalty no, or to seek an that's assurance that's of discontinuance, that's which that's is usually that's 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 a settlement or it should not prohibit lodging a complaint of sexual harassment. So yes. after and you it, settle things, you get your remedy for yourself, and you go ahead and file a complaint with these entities for the exact same incident you just settled on. There, as I understand the current law, uh, you're not prevented from basically notifying the attorney general um, that this behavior has been going on. But you, they would ask, you know, it, as part of their intake, as I understand it, they ask, and you can say, well, I've signed a settlement agreement that I wanted you to know. Um, that sort of thing. And that's what this is designed to prevent, is to prevent people from feeling that their settlement agreement is barring them from talking to the authorities. Um, because uh, when you have a non-disclosure agreement, depending on how it's worded, mm -hmm. You know, it, it may seem like, oh my gosh, if I talk to anyone under any circumstance, I'm facing significant contractual damages, and I'm afraid of those damages, so it chills my ability to notify public law enforcement that there's a bad situation. Uh, in this case, law enforcement being the AGs who enforce the, the civil law. You know, we're not talking about criminal sexual assault, which again, you can't get someone to sign a contract which says I'm not going to report a criminal action right, you can't. to the police. Um, and in the same way, it's against public policy if you have a right for the state to enforce, to prevent someone from notifying them. In this case, if the behavior is stopped, I mean, you'd, you'd want to ask the Attorney General's office about what their practice would be. But my expectation or understanding would be that if the behavior is stopped, then that's where it stops. They file it away. If the behavior is ongoing with other people and they've got other complaints from that office, then they may seek to have that person come as a, in as a witness in another case. And you're saying that's existing law right now. You're, you're tightening it up here a little bit. Or this is about. just basically making a statement of that existing law be included in settlement agreements. So people know that I've waived my rights to seek a remedy for myself but I'm not prevented from talking to the Attorney General. I'm not prevented from talking to the Human Rights Commission if the, if the offending employer is the state. Um, and, or I'm not prevented from, you know, if I'm within, and it's, it's probably unlikely if you're at the settlement agreement stage, that you're within the 180-day filing period for the EEOC. But um, it's more likely that it's going to be at the state level. But in either event, you're, I'm not prevented if it's, um, there, there are sometimes contract rules around this, so there may be a different federal agency that's, that's reviewing a contract and compliance with requirements and federal executive orders and that sort of thing. Um, and so that might be another instance. Um, so I'm just curious, and maybe Sarah's going to get to this, because I know Sarah has asked for us in addition to what was passed. Yes, you haven't gotten to that. Yet. No, I haven't. I apologize. My parents' doctor called, and so That's sadly, what those you have to that. take. Yes, um, but on this, you know what these uh, non-disclosure agreements. Where is the, you know, is it typical that in those agreements that that the other half does does the uh, the person the harasser have to promise? Or does the harasser agree anywhere in these agreements to not do this again? I mean, who's who's monitoring their behavior to make sure it's not happening again? Or is it constantly have to be a complaint-driven system? Or is there like parole, somebody who's actually checking in to make sure that scene isn't uh, duplicated again and again and again? So, what's the positive prevention going forward from situations? The it's. Under the current system, prevention is deterrence. 
Um, you know, so it's the deterrent effect of the laws prohibiting it. It's the deterrent effect of uh, if you know if you've been uh, if you've signed one expensive settlement agreement. Um, it's the deterrent effect of wanting to avoid that situation again in the future. Um, you know, or if you're, you know, you know, for I think many employers, it's the, you know, just the goal of creating a good workplace. Um, they want to have a good workplace for their employees and so forth. So they're proactively trying to avoid having a, an environment where something like this would ever happen. Um, but I think, you know, as far as the legal remedies go here, a settlement agreement doesn't say um, individual... So the, doesn't have promises from both sides? One promise is, okay, I won't pursue this, uh, you know, or, or, or I settle on one side, but if there's no agreement on the other side, I will be a better actor. Okay, I won't pursue this in return for the following acts, and maybe one of those acts is updating the sexual harassment policy, but it's not necessarily saying... Because usually there's, well, usually yeah, there's so no admission right. of wrongdoing in a, right. in a settlement agreement. So you're not... Uh, so how do we get it? So I mean, that's, that's... Yeah, so it's like you're in a different... I'm sorry. No, uh, it, in a different area. If we're not talking about sexual harassment at all, if you're settling like a, a civil dispute, like you have a dispute over a contract, the sides may not agree that there was a breach of contract, but they may say... You know, the side that's accused of breaching the contract is not going to say, oh, yeah, I breached it, and I'm going to agree to do that. They may say that, uh, you know, we're just going to acknowledge that you believe that you were harmed, and we think that harm is reasonably, like, this is a reasonable evaluation of that harm, and we'll agree to make this go away for that rather than pursuing the risk and uh, difficulty of litigation. You know, so in a lot of these cases, it's the same thing. We're not going to necessarily be able to agree that. So they're not admitting guilt necessarily, but they are agreeing to compensation or to whatever. To make it go away. To and, make it go that's, away. That's but why attention to the settlement agreements is important in terms oh, of leveling absolutely. the playing field. Um, because if you are aware that your harasser is continuing to harass and you feel like you have been bound from being able to uh, do anything to, about to speak to anybody about that um, then then it allows this uh, this culture to persist that allows sexual harassers to continue yeah it's it's too yeah, bad I don't think anybody questioning that I think the question was more of the one incident that was settled not that you couldn't go forward and complain about future and I understand the reason for it, and it's, it's existing law that I think mm -hmm. we should. Yeah, move on. Okay. I just don't understand why anybody settles if if it's still. It, it, it's, it probably has a chilling effect on settlements, but no, no, I don't understand why. Because, why you'd settle if you knew it was ongoing? Well, we keep saying because the company wants to make it go away, but if current law is that it doesn't go away, they can they can just take the money and go. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd like to get rid of the idea of settling them all together and have them- Or I'd like to get rid of them occurring the whole time. I just don't understand the psychology of giving a, a, a complainant $100,000 knowing that he or she could go the next day to the AG or the Human Rights Commission and be perfectly within their rights to both keep $100,000 and Absolutely. lodge Yep. That's a presidential level settlement. Most settlements here are well, but, twenty thousand dollars or you know what I mean? But, it's it's less. It, it, but until you're going to get the actor to agree to not do it again, you have to preserve that ability because otherwise they're just going to go and harass everybody else. I'm just, I'm just talking about why. Right, but if, if there's no crime, what is the Human Rights Commission going to do that uh, you know someone keeps sexually harassing someone? So if they've settled, yeah. so there's no actual crime, so there's nothing that they can move forward with. But this says it doesn't, with, get, doesn't correct. get rid of the crime. Yes, no, they can say they haven't corrected their behavior. So the, the state has remedies that it can pursue yeah. if it thinks that there is a reason to pursue them. Yeah. It can pursue an assurance of discontinuance, which is basically an agreement with the employer that the behavior is going to stop. It usually has 
you know, like, uh, it, it, well, the Attorney General's office can speak more to this, but my understanding is often it'll be like, we're gonna do some mandatory training for our supervisors, and we agree to stop the behavior, or, you know, we're gonna update our harassment policy, something like that. Mm -hmm. They can pursue a monetary penalty, but my understanding is often they'll, they may settle it for less than the penalty they can pursue in court, or they may settle for the agreement to make the behavior stop, because what they're looking mm -hmm. for is compliance, rather than necessarily, I mean, they have two attorneys. Rather than compensation. There, yeah, there are two attorneys in the civil rights unit, so they don't uh, necessarily have the resources to, you know, take every, every person who violates the law and try to seek a maximum penalty. What they're looking for is folks to comply with the law so that they don't, I mean, their, their goal is, is that people abide by the law rather than that they punish people right. for. Oh, that's the way know. most of our laws work. Right, I mean, and we whereas the, the civil comply. suit is more seeking, more seeking your, your uh, compensation and, and recovery for the harm you've received, which right. can be more than that civil penalty. I mean, you could be looking for punitive damages and compensatory damages and attorney's fees, which could dwarf the actual recovery for the other damages. Um, you know, I mean, attorney's fees for a case could easily go twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars if you go to an appeal and that sort of thing. Um, and so that that's what really could be the, you know, that's the incentive for an employer um, and also for an employee is it's a long, painful process for both sides, both in terms of cost and, uh, you know, just an emotional and psychological energy. So forgive me, were we walking through the bill or were you... Yeah, I was going to say, should, should the, we get to your ass? Yeah, because you, Sarah has an ass yeah. independent right. above and beyond what's yeah, exactly. here in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the landscape around um, kind of leveling the playing field for the victim of harassment um, in the in the settlement agreement area uh, really needs I, th I think and and there were, are others who will come here and testify um, that uh, that we believe it, it's important to be a bit more explicit with respect to the circumstances under which um, somebody who has signed a settlement agreement can uh, can um, share the the information of their case with a future victim and so I understand the interest in having bumpers put around that because I, you know, I don't think that we want to completely blow open the landscape around um, settlements to the extent, that, you know, as Damien just walked us through. The settlement is is a tool that can be beneficial to all three parties: the employer, the offending employee, and the victim. Um, but uh, but it is particularly. Um, painful for a victim of sexual harassment who has gone through the, the, all of the ups and downs and turmoil of achieving a settlement uh, to, to then become aware that there are future victims. And none of us in this climate where we are becoming aware of how pervasive sexual harassment is, um, none of us wants to, to continue to be a part of the problem that, um, that uh, you know, I've heard people say, you know, that they're likening this to, you know, passing on an abusing priest. None of us wants to be the Boston Archdiocese in this, okay? Yeah. We, we want to make sure that we are making a change at this moment that makes it uh, clear that we want to put an end to harassment. And so the loophole that we need to work on, and I had a long conference call with Julio Thompson, who's the Civil Rights Division Attorney at the AG's office, um, what we're trying to figure out is how to how to propose some language that would in in some way allow somebody with a sexual harassment settlement and an NDA to be able to assist a future victim of the same harasser. And I I understand the interests in keeping that narrow, and so that's why it's taken us a while to to really figure out a way to do that. So and that goes back to my concern, which is why in these cases, are, is the future harasser not promising or not making explicit that they are not doing this again? I mean, you know, that's the problem. Is you mean that, you in, know, the you disclosure, the, in the non-disclosure? Yeah, exactly, in this settlement. So, they, so people, 
and I know, understand Damien's point about them not being willing to uh, settle a case, but not promise to correct the behavior. And Sarah's point is, so you, so you have this agreement, but there's been no agreement to prevent future a victims, or there's been no agreement to oh, not go that. forward harassing people. And there has to, if, if we can't get at that in, in, a, in a settlement, uh, well, we don't know whether that is, since we haven't really seen settlements and haven't spoke to an attorney who's drafted settlements, we don't know whether that's in there or not. Is that correct, Damon? We've looked at some. That, uh, so it's so an agreement uh, that the uh, abuser or the perpetrator um, can't sexually harass other people. So, um, you know, I think... One thing that uh, my expectation is that that's probably not in many, if, if any. Um, I would certainly encourage the committee to talk to both some employer side attorneys and some plaintiff side attorneys on this issue. I know that just from my own experience before I came to the legislature, where I, I need to be clear, I didn't work on employment litigation um, and certainly never worked on a sexual harassment case. But in the settlements that I drafted and related to the work, in relation to the work I did, they tended to vary with the case. And there might be some sort of boilerplate language that you insert, but it's going to vary based on the facts of the right. claims and but who's involved and, you know, the, the, the nature of you know, does the other side have a strong case or a weak case, and why is it that we're pursuing settlement? So there's a lot of factors, and so I think uh, even if you looked at one or two settlements, I think drawing the conclusion that it's representative point is, is pretty risky. Yeah. Um, but I, I would certainly encourage the committee to get more testimony from attorneys who are drafting That's what they're doing. or working on this litigation uh, on a regular basis. There, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, definitely the AG's office. There were a couple of employer side attorneys uh, that spoke in House General that you may want to hear from, and there may be others that you know or other folks in the building. Um, if we, so if you want, yeah, if you want to drill down on on this issue a little bit more, yeah. I would recommend that you talk to an attorney named Beth Dannon, and I can get you her contact. Yeah. I can get Kayla her contact information if you don't have it. Um, she tends to be <laughs> perfect. She tends to. She is one of the few attorneys that I've talked to, and I've talked to a lot of attorneys about this legislation because I really wanted to get a 360 degree view. Um, unfortunately, what I have found in a lot of the conversations that I've had with attorneys is that that you know the bread and butter in in this scenario is not the random worker who has been sexually who harassed, who has a strong enough case and a strong enough willpower to go out and seek an attorney to, to help them with a the settlement. The bread and butter of these cases is the on the employer side, and so a lot of the attorneys that you talk to will really. Um, make a strong case for the status quo and for um, and for not changing anything with respect to either pre-employment or settlement agreements um, because the system is working. I know that Beth has a much more of, of, of a balance in her experience and she has represented um, uh, harassed employees um, much more heavily than some of the other attorneys have. Um, in addition, I would recommend that you uh, have some time with uh, Lisa Senecal, who, uh, who has experience, first-hand experience with a sexual harassment, a uh, couple of sexual harassment incidents, but also a, a, a settlement agreement. But now she uh, has a, a company which yeah. helps to advise um, people on how to, uh, how to move through this system. Uh, she's got a wealth of knowledge about this landscape, um, and Carrie Brown, uh, who is uh, um, right, with the Women's right Commission, here. can uh, can give you a number of different kinds of examples of places. Now, we're all talking about you know a victim who who has the the knowledge and the education level and the and the economic stability and uh, and the fortitude to go out and seek a remedy. 
for sexual harassment. The vast majority of sexual harassment right. are working paycheck to paycheck. They can't afford to piss off their boss by making trouble and by reporting illegal activities. Right. And so, by and large, they tend to either put up with it, and in which case that is a very hostile work environment, um, or they leave and they'll take whatever job they can get to go to, um, even if it pays less, because they just need to get out of that harassing environment. So I want us to be aware as we're moving this legislation through that we're not just talking about you and me, you know, no, well-educated people who are not empowered, people who have resources. We're talking about the wait server. We're talking about the factory line worker. We're talking about the store clerk at Hannaford. Um, and so, and so, you know, I, I think I can, I can kind of finish what I have on the, the whole um, sexual harassment settlement section of it, because I would like to talk to you a little bit about some of the other provisions of it. Um, the last thing that I want to say about the sexual harassment settlements um, are this, this uh, don't darken my door provision, and I know that the committee had some questions about that last time, um, you know, about wondering what, why that's necessary. First and foremost, it's necessary because such refresh, refresh my memory what that is. Okay. Oh, don't darken my door. It means is that um, in here? We, we're going to pay you off for this sexual harassment claim. You will agree never to work for us or any of our uh, affiliate organizations okay. again. At its fundamental level, that is re-victimizing the victim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is taking away a job opportunity currently and forever in the future to somebody who reported illegal behavior. Companies ought to be applauding that, that kind of uh, bravery, um, not punishing that kind of bravery. And the state of Vermont, I understand, is one of the biggest offenders with respect to this. Oh, really? the settlement agreements that are made um, with the state of Vermont typically will include that. Now, the state of Vermont is one of our largest employers, is our largest employer. If you were sexually harassed working as a clerk at the Department of Motor Vehicles, and what you'd like to do is, uh, you know, at some point in the future, you know, apply for, for a job in a satellite office with DCF and White River Junction, you're prohibited from doing that with your sexual harassment uh, settlement agreement. If you're a nurse at... it to the bill? It is in there right now, yes. And, and I'm just making a case for why it's important that okay. it stay. Uh, you know, if you're a nurse at UVM Medical Center, uh, that's a big system, and it's getting bigger all the time. Um, and so, you know, this is really a provision of fairness uh, that, that uh, prohibiting somebody from coming back to work for your organization uh, is, uh, is very um, kind of against the cultural change that we're trying to uh, establish here and, and put underway. So um, just recommending, you know, Beth Dan and Carrie Brown, Lisa Seneca for, for testimony. Great. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing that's uh, particularly important in this bill um, is the ability for the Attorney General's Office to do, uh, to do inspection of a workplace in the same way that, um, you know, that, that OSHA comes in and inspects compliance for workplace safety. Uh, the Attorney General's Office is the, is the place where we can go to, uh, to inspect for compliance uh, in terms of employment discrimination and hostile work environment. And, uh, and so just granting that inspection right, as Damien said a few minutes ago, they only have two attorneys. They're not running around, uh, you know, inspecting all over the place. Um, but being able to, you know, to, to inspect what a, an employer's policies are, uh, what is their reporting procedure, ask an employee, who, if you were sexually harassed, who would you report to? Maybe that person knows, maybe they don't know. That could indicate that the employer isn't doing uh, a good enough job of educating uh, employees. Um, and I know that you all had some questions about um, prevention training, but before I talk about that, is there, did you have any other questions for me on? So these, um, the inspection power is new in this bill? Yes. Okay, and is it other provisions for unannounced Inspections? Um, I think what ended up was 48 hours notice and that the AG's office will go through rulemaking. Is the rulemaking um, with respect to the inspection procedures? With respect to the whole sexual harassment section, okay. but I think the primary reason for putting it in there is so that they could put in rule what their inspection procedures are. Um, 
and it's just since the Attorney General is heavily involved in some of the other pieces throughout here, it, it made sense to just extend it to the whole section. Did you, did you get, the, was this ultimately that the bill that came out of committee, was it controversial in the no. committee or on the floor? Not on the floor, it passed. No. Like, did I didn't even have call? to stand and speak on the floor. I mean, there was no debate. It, it passed with only two no votes. Yeah, and um, in the committee, I think, I remember I actually had the committee vote here, I think it passed without a, a no vote. I think it was 10 0 1. Yeah, um, and the, the change in the, in the uh, sort of auditing or inspection provisions was to add a 48 hour notice for the yeah. employers so that they know. Uh, so it's not like a spot, you know, hi, I'm from the Attorney General's right. office. Uh, I'm here to <laughs> look at your records and talk to your HR person. And, all that it's it's basically saying we'd like to come by on Tuesday. Is there a good time yeah. for you? We'll be in the area between you know one and five. Okay. Um, so. So, so did you see in in committee or do you know whether the committee saw a um, a copy of a non disclosure or a uh, do not darken my door provision within? The non-disclosure agreement. Did you see an example of that? Mm -mm, I don't think they did. I don't think they looked through those kinds. Of I'm just wondering how, no, how are we verifying that that in fact is an aspect of how Vermont, as an employer, is conducting business. Uh, that's a good question. So there, good there question. were. Uh, I believe there was testimony uh, about that. Okay. Um, From who though? I, I can't remember. I believe there was some testimony. There are certainly, the committee did not look at any examples of, of settlement agreements. I think part of it is is that an executed settlement agreement is usually private. Um, or redacted. Or redacted or something like that. Um, and so those are usually not uh, available to the public. Um, and then an, an unexecuted settlement agreement isn't isn't very valuable for the reasons I mentioned earlier. I know that there, well, well, I think that there may have also been testimony from some attorneys saying that they don't typically include that provision in their settlement agreements that they do for the employers they represent. But if, um, if the state's attorneys yeah. are drafting these, we should be able to contact those attorneys and say, we are also the state. We'd, I, like, we'd like to know what format you use. Have you ever generated these kinds of Yeah, clauses. I think you could get, um, you know, so Julio Thompson doesn't represent the state. Right. Uh, in those cases, that's a different branch of the AG's office. You can either ask them, or you may just want to contact the Commissioner of Human Resources, um, since her department would be the one that's sort of overseeing these grievances that result yeah. in the settlement. We just had her in here, it's too bad she didn't stick around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, I just think that's, that's a huge part of this from. for me. I yep. mean, that's no, and when you oh, say it's just, if that is in fact the case, then we so, need to confirm that's the case. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've heard anecdotally stories of certainly that. You have? Oh, yeah. By state employees. Oh, not by that's state what I'm employees. Talking about. Okay, yeah. I'm talking about I the biggest that. employer state in the state. Yeah. In general. Yes. So I'd like to go back to your, you mentioned something about pre-employment agreements. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about that. Can we, uh, uh, are there pre-employment agreements, like pre-nuptial agreements, but I promise not to harass, or I promise, uh, you know, I mean, I, again, I'm trying to get at more prevention rather mm -hmm. than having to, uh, yeah. to go after somebody again. So yeah, no, I, I appreciate where you're coming from. And, and in general, we tried not to put extra burdens or requirements on employers um, in this bill, uh, instead just removing the barriers for, uh, for, for people who have been harassed. Um, so the, the pre-employment agreements, um, again, we didn't review a number of them, um, but just in talking with attorneys who, who uh, have seen them, um, we wanted to make sure that it was explicit that in a pre-employment agreement you can't be asked to waive your uh, your rights and remedies. So I um, flip that and, and actually say, you know, it particularly following people who have had 
uh, who have been the actor or the harasser in in settlements. Again, to go back to your spotlight, yeah. you're not wanting to perpetuate this behavior wherever they go. Is it would be great for them to have to certify that or, or, or say. I, I won't be doing this. I will not be. Well, so that that's behavior. that's really interesting because it it is really so difficult to. It's such a gray line between between what is harassment and what isn't. Let's let's say Senator Susie and I went to college together. We're we're old buddies. We've been friends forever. Um, he and I might have a very different sort of relationship. Um, on you know from from an outside observer standpoint because we've known each other for thirty years. Um, he might he might come up and give me a hug and you know ask me how my date was over the weekend and that might be completely normal because he and I have known each other for 30 years if another person did similar behavior um, perhaps with the intent of, uh, of instigating a romantic involvement that might be really offensive to me and somebody looking from the outside might say well you know she just said the same thing that he said so like what's the difference and, right. so, no, and so you can't you can't yeah. really I'm ask somebody I'm to, to how, do you, how do you ask somebody to agree not to sexually harass someone? Well, because if somebody has been <laughs> has been part of a settlement agreement, mm. they where does that show up on their work record? It doesn't. Okay, so that's the problem. Is how do we? For me, this is a, an issue that you know what's the consequence to the harasser? It's got to show up somewhere so that then they either have to for their next job say I'm I won't. You know, somewhere it, it, it would be great to get at a preventive way for them to agree they aren't going to. So there was behavior. there was one. Um, Are you trying to give me something? Ethan? The governor wants to do something. Um, there was one um, component of the bill that that I intentionally left in at, um, through this 360 degree vetting process that I knew was going to need to be taken out, and it really was trying to get at I think what you're getting at. Um, and that was um, to require um, uh, the parties to a sexual harassment settlement to be sent, uh, notified to the Attorney General's office for a confidential, non-disclosable, non-searchable, just a log of, you know, party A, party B, employer. Um, and then, and then, an employer could call right. that, or and then if the attorney general's office five years down the road got a call and said, you know, from party A, you know, at least you you would have a log of the fact that party A or party B or that employer were involved in previous sexual harassment settlements. Now, the rationale for not collecting that information was was very understandable. Um, you don't want to you don't want the implication being that there actually was illegal behavior because that settlement agreement does not require people to uh, to agree that they engaged in illegal behavior. Um, and uh, and you know so there's a lot of concern on the part of employers uh, and. And alleged harassers that having their name on a list somewhere at the attorney general's office would be um, a disadvantage to them. Would be a disincentive to uh, to enter into a settlement agreement. I happen to think that as a matter of public good and as a matter of public interest, knowing the extent to which we have claims either at a particular employer, maybe that's where the attorney general would decide to to use their you know two or three audits that they have time to do this month you know maybe they would look at a place that had a number of sexual harassment That's settlements yeah um, the AG's office doesn't want to collect that information um, I, and I understand their rationale for for why but I just think that that there is a missing link here in yeah. terms of how do we how do we make sure that we're actually getting at the problem when we don't know the extent? We don't know how many sexual harassment settlements happen out there. Exactly. I think that we, yeah. So, frustrating. So, you fully support this bill and you'd like to see it go further on the non disclosure? Further you on, right. Work, are you working yes. on the proposal? Of the and you have language right? that you're working on. The AG's office um, is, has been very helpful in trying to figure that out. I, I don't know if he's communicated his ideas to you yet, because we just talked about it on Monday. So. And so basically it's that a victim can share information with another victim. With a future victim. With a future yeah. victim, uh, despite an NDA or... Yeah. 
you know, the, the, the concept is we've signed an agreement. What's in the past is in the past. But if there is future instances of sexual harassment, um, it, it seems unfair to to uh, disallow somebody from, from helping I think it victim. would be difficult to watch it going on or hearing that it's going, saying, you know what, yeah. it happened to me too. Right. And this is what he did or yeah. she did. Yeah, I just wish we could get at the prevention piece more fully. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're in a situation where this this is, uh, the law is improving and we're making progress, hopefully. Yes. I think you want, it sounds to me like you almost want to go to the point where this is the same level of, like, child abuse or, um, right. or, uh, all those criminal registries where you're on a list and you can't move to a place like that. If you want that to be out there in the public, I'm not sure we're ready. So the reason we're not ready for that is because there, there has traditionally been such a stigma for women to come forward and say, I'm being harassed. Because it's hard to say to somebody, um, you know, who has just watched me and my pal, who I happen to work with, uh, and has said something similar, it's hard for me to then say to that next person, what you said crossed the line. You know, like I, I, you and I don't have that kind of relationship. That is not an easy conversation. And the stigma of coming forward and complaining and the risk of retaliation to people who have seen others retaliated against for coming forward and complaining means that something has to get really awful before people are willing to step up. And what I wanna do is figure out how you know these are these are first steps but how can we lower the bar open up the line of communication so that it becomes easier just to say mm, you know no thanks that's in the stupid zone remember when we had our prevention oh, yeah. training you weren't here for that yeah, but no. that's in our stupid zone that's in you the stupid had zone harassment training no, I have. We did, have you, did we have Senate. it at the beginning of this oh, yeah. year oh. um, so if you remember the stupid zone you know there ought to be a yeah. code word that we can use to uh, oh, right, we had it with all of you coming and chatting with us. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we did. We missed out on the uh, Karen Stock poll training. Yeah, yes. she was great. She talked about the stupid zone. And that's the one yeah. thing we were all remember. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. And so this, you know, this is a first step. I, you know, there's been a lot of talk about whether we should require um, sexual harassment for prevention training in workplaces and what that would look like. And, um, you know, the fact of the matter is most sexual harassment training is in out there in workplaces is being done with the intent of protecting the company and uh, ensuring ensuring compliance with uh, with the law for the company right. not necessarily in changing the culture we don't have a I won't do it again in the legislative sexual harassment policies do we that's what I'd like well you'd have to I'd like uh, to you'd have to admit line. that what you Promise. did first was was illegal behavior in order well, right. to be asked. You have to go to the, yeah. uh, not committee, what is it, panel? Yeah. Yeah. So if you went before the panel, uh, there isn't a uh, requirement that you say, you know what, I won't do it again. Mm -hmm. Do you? This, this like so well, that would have to mean you were agreeing that you've done it, as opposed to just saying, okay, I'm going to pay you this to shut up. It, that's that's the problem for me, is we don't go forward fixing This, this is they sound like a naive question, but is, is any kind of sexual harassment as we try to define it in this context, is it ever criminal behavior or does it have to reach the level of assault or something? Yeah. Okay. yeah, and so there are a thousand shades right. of gray between, right. you know, incidental you know, inappropriate com touching comments through to inappropriate yeah. touching through to assault. Um, well, we're done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I Thanks. appreciate Thank your you. time. We look Thank forward you. to seeing what you come up with. Right now. Yeah. Two minutes. Just. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can wait. No, no. Yeah, we can get the. Thank you very much.